All right. Hello, Fortinos, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is April 1st, 2023. Oh, my goodness. How excited are we? What are we looking at? What are we looking at? Less than a week, six days. This ministry, or most of us, we are watching and praying for this day right here. Not a thus saith the Lord, not a, a I had a dream or a vision, although these things happen. This is from revelation through discernment of the word that we have been digging into for about five and a half years. And what a ride it has been. Brothers and sisters, this will be my last video. Oh, okay, I couldn't do it. <laughs> I was gonna be, I was gonna be like, okay, how long can I hold this? No, I can't even hold it. Somebody's gonna try and use it against me and take a clip out and say something. No, uh, Yanni, last night we were talking in a Zoom and one of our brothers and he was like, yeah, Alan's doing, he's not doing any more videos. He's put an end to it. And he was saying, ah, no, April 1st. So I thought I'd play along, but I just couldn't hold it. <laughs> See, I'd, I'd suck at doing that, right? So. No, it's not my last video, although, you know, depending how things play out, you know, maybe there's room for one more video. Depends on what the Lord has going on in this period, right? We're looking for the possibility of the stone's throw that can come before the escape. It might happen during this time, but, you know, right after the escape. But we are right in that range. We know it's about to take place. The last video right here the last video if you guys haven't seen it man you want to come and watch this video you want to understand some of the things that have been revealed in this ministry and, and the details that have been revealed through this ministry man i'm telling you it's it, it's not me i i have no idea why i was chosen as the vessel to bring this about to bring about the revelation of our lord and savior his is to come you see, this is, this is a piece of scripture a lot of people don't really get, right? Ecclesiastes 1.9. The thing that has been, Old Testament was, is that which shall be, meaning it's still going to play out in a version. And that which is done, which, is, which are the things of the New Testament, the is that we're still living in until the moment the end times begin with the escape, are the is that shall also be done. Which means what? What has been in the Old Testament, what is the New Testament, both are revealing the is to come. That is, that is so wild to understand because what this is telling us is you can read once you have end time eyes, once you have the eyes to be able to see, once you have the discernment given and you spend time in scripture, study these, study these videos, take the time. There's a reason why I give five days in between videos because they're big videos. They're packed with detail. I still have people that say, oh, why are your videos so long? <clears throat> Look, it's a study. It's a study. It's a breakdown. It's revelation. You have to take the time to go in and seek it. Be diligent, right? Because what is in this is the revelation of the Lord. And that piece of scripture is a piece of scripture that is the evidence to say, well, wait a second. Does that mean it's going to play out just like it did in the past? Does that mean it's going to play out just like it did in the New Testament? No. You have to understand types and shadows, right? These are typologies that you have to have the ability to discern, to see and to understand how they are typologies playing out in the is to come. We, this is something, we're going to get into all sorts of things today, but it has to do with this piece in relation to the seven churches that we're going to talk about briefly later on as well. You see, it's things that in the Old Testament played out over like, what, 2,500 years. You have the New Testament played out by about 2,000 years. The was shall be. The is shall be. But the shall be is going to play out over 14 years. That's crazy to understand. How do you discern something like that? Only through the Spirit. Only through the Spirit. I couldn't have done one iota of this. I didn't even know these things existed. 
Do you think I, I wanted to start saying, oh, the tribulation's 14 years? Seven years of seals, seven years of trumpets, and everybody missed the first because they didn't understand the gospels? They didn't understand, not that they didn't understand the gospels in the is. They didn't understand the gospels that are filled with prophecy in type and shadows for the is to come. You see, I didn't even know this stuff existed. That's how I know it's through the spirit led. <laughs> Just ask my wife. She'll have no problem telling you I had no clue because I didn't even read my Bible five and a half years ago. King James was like a tongue twister to me. So, guys, this, for some reason, the Lord has used me as the vessel and you guys as well to understand it, to discern it, to share it, to, to go and seek it for yourselves to see that these things are true. And man, what a ride it has been you know and and how much do we have left before it all begins i don't know maybe one more video prayerfully maybe only one more video what one two three four we might not even get to another video <laughs> funny i said that maybe it is my last video right prayerfully god willing it is the last video we shall see there might be one more but we shall see and so I'd been debating on uh, on today's video and where I was going to go with it. And I, I had an idea to, you know, go into the workers again and do more detail into the workers than we had since we'd last done it. But I thought, man, we talk a lot about the workers. We've done a lot of the breakdown about the workers. The last video in relation to the 50 days, um, we spoke about that group and when they're chosen and, and the events that take place there. So I figured... No, I'm not going to go in that direction. I was, and I also wanted to continue from the the previous ones over here, where where we understood these worker groups and and what that final portion in Matthew 24 and and how and who it's talking about when. But I didn't really want to spend too much time in going into the the stuff that surrounds the again conversation. So. I'd been contemplating and contemplating, and it wasn't until this afternoon, <laughs> literally this afternoon, and I was like, okay, I'm going to go down this road. And so what this road is going to be today is, you know, I think the title of this video is going to be The Revelation. And so what is meant by that is that I'm going to cover some of these big topics that have come to be revealed over the last five and a half years. We're not going to go crazy into depth into everything. I'm not going to go um, uh, into, I'm not even going to go into everything, let alone go into the depth of everything. Because as you guys know, it would be like spending a four day weekend doing eight or 10 hours a day to be able to go through uh, a good chunk of what we're talking about. But we're going to hit on some of these big main points I mean, we're talking like a dozen maybe different places. You know, things like the revelation of the Gospels because it, you know, how that was missed because of Matthew. We're talking about the 14 years and the revelation of the 14 years and, and how the big picture is really 21 years and how the first seven were quote unquote like easy years. Showing that pre, mid and post is actually all true, right? To be able to understand it and to see it in scripture to, to understand why there were so many debates, whether it was pre or whether it was mid or whether it was post and churches have separated and arguments are going on. We can prove the reason why scripture has all three of them that people can point to is because all three are true. Then we've got this crazy one, right? This one called chapters to years. That's one that people generally have a really hard time uh, uh, getting into at first. Because they say, well, man made the chapters, man made the verses. It, it's as if man also wrote it, and they'll agree that it was Holy Spirit inspired, yet the number one all-time best-selling Bible, the King James in all of human history, year after year, no, no, the, the Spirit didn't guide the people who, who put the Bibles together into chapters, into years, they, they, uh, chapters into verses. Um, no, the spirit couldn't be involved in any of that. The spirit couldn't be involved in, in the Strong's Concordance word definitions. Of course he was. And we can prove it by these revelations of what we call chapters to years. How about the 70th year? 
without understanding the 70th year? Do you know nobody could ever know when the tribulation would start? You know, we were talking about this <clears throat> in a private Zoom last night that, you know, I don't believe the Lord is going to tell anybody when the day is. Not, not even myself. I don't believe he's going to tell anybody. But through the revelation, the diligent seeking and revelation of his word, through what we've been given to understand, I believe we can understand the time frame and probably even get the day. The hour, no. But the day and be right in the range of it? Yes, I believe so. Because there are certain things that have to be understood before you can even get there. And 70 years is one of those huge pieces that needed to be understood. You know, this is something we spoke about uh, a lot in the past, that when the 70 years initially passed, the whole world that spoke on, pri on prophecy, those that did, never spoke about 70 years again when 70 years ended. And as far as I know, we are the only ministry in English speaking, but we've got people from all over the world that continue to diligently seek the understanding of 70 years. Why? Well, we had to. We had to. Prophecy is directly connected to them being in the land for 70 years from whatever the understanding of this time was, according to the Lord God. Well, we've got that understanding, too. That's why this year is so important. It, it's the year of all years that connects it. What about the revelation of the seven churches? Right? I just showed that, that piece from, uh, on the screen about the seven churches, the was, the is, and the is to come. We have the revelation of the seven churches for the end of days, a mystery that the church had been seeking to understand for centuries. How about Daniel 9? Much of the book of Daniel in particular, we went through it in the four videos ago, five videos ago, in all Daniel to tribulation, right? And, and what about the revelation just in itself of Daniel 9? directly connected to 70 years. How about this one? 42 months, 1260 days, time and times and half a time. You see, the church has told us for centuries what? Well, 42 months and 1260 is the same amount of time. So they're just connected together. Oh yeah, but so, so is your time and times and half a time. Why isn't that 1260 connected with it? You see, there's all this confusion, and why would the Lord have a separate time of 42 months, 1260, and time, end times, and half a time, if they're actually just talking about the same period of time, all three of them, or two out of the three? There are three separate definitions because there's three separate periods of time. And if they're all three and a half years, guess what? That in itself is 10 and a half years, right? But we know there's more to it than just that. What else do we have? How about Antichrist versus Satan? You see, because people only see seven years, they think Antichrist is Satan. But we can go to Revelation chapter 16, and you can see it the, in the bowls that spirits like frogs come out of the beast, the false prophet, and the dragon. How is that possible if there's only two, right? They have Satan and the Antichrist as one, and they have the false prophet on his own. Well, that would mean there's only two of them. We've proven that there's all three. And the only way to do that is to understand that it's 14 years. One is anti-Christ. One is going against Christ's people. One is going against the Father's people. Okay? Then you have the creation story. How about that mind-blowing revelation of creation? That it wasn't one creation, but there are three portions to the creation. We've proven that out with Scripture. With scripture, and, and how did it start? Not just with the end of days, but with the 14 years, but became the bigger picture of the 21. And the way to understand that <clears throat> started with Jacob. Mind-blowing stuff, right? And to understand that the alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet is 22 letters, right? Revelation is 22 chapters. It's seven, 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 and one. Just like the menorah is set up with the almond blossoms. It's everywhere. The revelation of what? 50, 14, 50. What about that one? Right? The creation was spirit, light, and then flesh. Right? You have the Holy Spirit's portion, the Son's portion, the Father's portion. 
It's, it's absolutely incredible. And the 50, 14, 50 was a revelation confirmed to us by the Holy Ghost, the only one we've ever received that confirmed that the video that I'd done, that I was going to take down, that the Holy Spirit said, in quotations, right on target. And that was the revelation of 50 days, 14 years, and the 50th Jubilee. And that's what this was about, the first 50 days that come before the actual 14 years of tribulation begin. Will it actually start at day one of 50? Yes. But the official of everything kicking off and Jerusalem then being destroyed comes at the end of the 50 days. How about the Son of Man? Try to share that with people, right? Try to share that the Son of Man is actually going to be, for, be here for 40 days as he said he would. That's a mystery that really throws a bunch of people off. They say, no, that's impossible. He doesn't return till feet down. Yes, as King of Kings and Lord of Lords and all that stuff, but he's coming as the Son of Man, as Jonah was. Right? Those were, that's prophetic within the Gospels. How about the worker groups? How about being able to discern from John, Luke, Mark, and Matthew that there are four groups of workers? That there's going to be apostles from day one of 50. That there's going to be a disciple group from the Luke group that'll be with the Lord for 40 days and work through tribulation. At least the seals, but maybe even trumpets. How about that the end of Mark reveals that there's another group that's going to work trumpets called the 144,000. And then when it's all over, you've got a group that represents the 12 tribes that are going to go out during the millennial reign. And all four of these groups are proven within the Gospels, revealed for the end of days. And in the book of Revelation, all four of them are there. It's awesome. And what about crazy stuff like again? When it comes to the again, that is not something I recommend people share with anybody up front. And what I mean by that is if somebody doesn't yet understand the revelation of the Gospels and the years and, and that Antichrist and Satan are, are separate and are coming in their times and then together. <clears throat> and when the Son of Man comes, that he's coming, there's the pre-trib escape. There's, there's the, the 40 days of the Son of Man. He returns at the end of the sixth year of seals, and then he's here for the first half of trumpets. He's cut off. And then there's an again thing that's going to happen before he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. Think about all of these revelations. And we can take every single one of these into the Gospels, into the discourses, into the book of Revelation, into Daniel, into the creation story, into Psalms, into the law of Moses, into the prophets. And every single time we do the same story of all of these revelations emerge it's over the top it is so wild that it's sometimes hard to imagine or even recall everything that we've been revealed everything and every time we found new things that the spirit has led us in Always, always, 100% always, every time connects. So you guys will already know how long this video is going to be. I don't know how long it is yet, but, you know, it's, it's a later start than usual. We were out with, for friends with dinner, and I was like, oh, I don't know if I want to do the video tonight. But, you know, my rule, I got to do it, you know, that four to five day period. And, um, you know, we're right near the tail end, man. We need to be reminded. We need to be strengthened. We need to ponder these things and be ready. You know, don't forget one of these things we've come to understand, right? That there's, there's a group of people, of disciples, that are connected to the, on, to the two on the road to Emmaus, who are directly connected to the Smyrna group, who are a group of workers for the time of the end. And when the Lord comes for 40 days, He's going to open their understanding of these things yet to be fulfilled about them. Their understanding of the scriptures are going to be opened. And I believe that what's been going on in this ministry for the past five and a half years is the preparation of this. I don't know with certainty, but never before in human history 
has what we've been given to reveal over these few years ever been understood before? You see, the, these aren't made up things. They're not just, oh, I want this to be and I want that to be and I'm thinking this and I'm feeling that. I don't even show my face when I'm talking in these videos because the focus is the word. It is the revelation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Ponder on that sometimes. Think deeply into it sometimes. It freaks you out. Who on earth are we to have been blessed with such incredible revelation of the Lord that he has kept a mystery since before the foundations of the earth? Man. That's a tricky one, right? How, how do you even comprehend that? How do you really explain that to someone? There's only one way. You've got to watch. You've got to watch these videos. You have to take the time to go in and follow them and discern them, right? Like I always say, go to this playlist. Click on the playlist link. When you do, you're going to see this playlist right here, the Revealed End Time Study Note series. And what we're going to be talking about here tonight is directly connected to all of these things. You see, these th first three videos right here, a 30-minute Bible study to reveal who the Gospels are speaking to, a 30-minute Bible study to begin to understand who, uh, uh, to begin to understand the revelation of the 14 years, and then a big video, almost three hours long, on it's all because of Matthew. And the reason it's long is to help you understand that your entire foundation is built on the gospel of Matthew because that's the way it's been done for hundreds and hundreds of years. It was never known. It had never fully been understood who Mark and Luke were speaking to. That was the, that was the way it started here in this ministry. But when all of your foundation, even though you're not aware of it, your entire foundation is founded in the Gospel of Matthew. So you go to Mark and you go to Luke only for little other insights. You're not going to be able to understand prophecy if you don't first understand the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to. These three videos are going to blow your mind. Then you have one more detailed, right? The 40 days of the Son of Man, pre, mid, and post, the, the book of Daniel, the open books, the seven churches, to be able to understand seals and trumpets like you never have before. This is an incredible mystery called the comma and. And then, of course, the discourse is revealed. But before you can understand any of them, you need to start right here. It's, it, it, I, I don't even know, you know, I, I try to think, oh my goodness, Lord, what am I going to do for the next video? And then more insight comes, right? Spend a little bit of time in Scripture and more insight, more insight. And as we were talking about this last night in the, in the private Zoom, you know, you, you just think, how much more could there be? Now, we know the Lord, His Word will last forever. So there's always a greater depth and more that could be connected. But the point is, how much more do we need before it starts? You see? How much more is necessary before it begins? And this is, this is a, what this video talks about. This one right here was shared from, uh, what's, what was her name again? Behold, I Come. It was published four years ago, four years and change. I think it was in uh, 2018. She had the word from the Lord in 2015, I think it was. and. For anybody here in this ministry that wants to get it, come and watch from about the 10-minute mark to the 17-minute mark, and she's talking to us. Now, only to us? No, maybe she's a part of it. Maybe there's others for sure. But I can tell you what. What you're going to hear her talk about that the Lord told her, that he was preparing a group, that he had begun now to prepare a group, but when she got it in 2015, she didn't understand, and so he was holding it until for her to start releasing it in 2018 well guess when this ministry started september of 2017 when it officially it, it was in june but when the change something happened and i knew it 
It was in September of 2017. She released this in 2018, and the Lord said that he had now started to make known to a group of people. Why do I bring this up? Because a group of people that he's talking to and that she mentions in there is a group of people that the Lord told her were being reserved. They were kept for the time of the end. Our first Peter 1, 4, and 5, right? That to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fades not away, reserved for you in heaven, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, listen to this, ready to be revealed in the last time. That's the end of days, brothers and sisters. There is a group of people being prepared in the revelation of the Lord for the time to come. How could I not think that we in this ministry are connected to that? When, when you understand these things that we've been sharing, when you understand that, that there was a group in Smyrna, as the church of Smyrna back 2,000 years ago, who were called 14thers because they stood on the truth of the word that they learned from apostles, uh, from the apostle John and from disciples. And they stood on the word that the 14th of the first month at Abib was true Passover, regardless of the church moving everything to Easter. What happened to us? I unknowingly was calling us 14 14ers because not of the revelation of 14 days, but because of the revelation of 14 years. I didn't even know that group existed when I started it. I was just simply saying it because it was this revelation of 14 years that had become clear as day. And it turns out there was a Smyrna group that we know through scripture is directly connected to this Luke group. They're represented by the two on the road to Emmaus. Man. And, and, and what does the Lord tell them? That there are things yet to be fulfilled about him in the law of Moses, the first five books, in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning him. And that's what we've been revealing and beyond for the last five and a half years. When the Lord comes and starts his 40 days, if some of us here aren't taken, we'll be prepared. We know to be girded about and ready for when he comes and knocks. What do you think we're going to be prepared for? What he's about to make known in his understanding fully. Why? Because this will be a group of people that nobody will need to teach. Could you imagine that? There is nobody on earth right now that doesn't need a teach, doesn't need somebody to help them learn. But the day is coming when this group or this group of people that this represents as Smyrna will not have to have somebody teach them. And we just saw this group being reserved who are kept. They're kept and they'll be revealed at the time of the end. How about a ministry where all of this revelation is being given from the beginning of creation to the end of revelation? And then what, he's, he's just going to take that whole team out? All of the coaching, all of that is going to be removed and he's going to get go to a bunch of new people and say, okay, here's the understanding. They're going to say, of what? Of what? Prepared, watching for what? Man, I think we need to stay prepared. Keep watching, keep praying, remain diligent in his word. Seek these things for yourself to see that they be true. And you'll understand for yourselves. So like I said, let's go into a number of these things now. We're going to touch on a whole bunch of them. So how about some of these fun ones within the Gospels? This is one that happened quite early on. And I remember this one came about through our sister disciple, Tabitha, when she was reading through this in the Gospels. Because, you know, when you're first understanding and you're starting to see these differences and you grasp and you could say, oh, my goodness, Luke is to the bride of Christ. Mark is to the world in the sleeping church that's not ready. And 
Matthew, which is the house of Israel. And, <clears throat> and Matthew is written to the Jews. And you're like, oh my goodness. And then you start diligently looking through the gospels yourselves to see what these differences are. And that's what our sister disciple Tabitha did. <coughs> Excuse me. And she found the differences within the colors of the robes. Do you think they, that these guys were colorblind? That, you know, what was the difference? What was going on? In Luke, when Christ is going to the cross, he was arrayed in a gorgeous robe. See? Gorgeous, white, radiant, clear. When you go to Mark, you see that Jesus was arrayed in purple. When you go to Matthew, you see that he was arrayed in scarlet. Were these guys colorblind? Was it because one was looking from one angle and one from the other angle and one from another angle? No. There was prophecy built into this. What, do you, what is this telling us? <clears throat> How about we go to Revelation 17? <clears throat> Excuse me. In Revelation 17, what are the tribulation colors? Revelation 17, verse 4. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet. The woman riding the beast was arrayed in purple and scarlet. Was she arrayed in, in a gorgeous, white, beautiful white robe? No. That's for his bride. You see? How about this one? This is another fun one. Uh, 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 um, when Christ is on the cross. Okay? Listen to the wording when Christ is on the cross. Listen to what he says. Luke 23, verse 46. Father, into thine hands I commend my spirit. Right? Those would be my words. If I knew I was about to die or be beheaded or something, those are the words I would cry out, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. But what did he say in Mark and in Matthew? It was the same wording. You guys remember what he said? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Do you think Christ was actually believing he was forsaken? Or do you think maybe there was a message? Well, it turns out when you go into the word definition for forsaken, which is only found in the Mark version and in the Matthew version, it means to leave behind. Hello. You see, if Luke's is the bride, so the first will be last, the last will be first. Matthew, Mark, Luke will become Luke, Mark, Matthew in the Synoptic Gospels. What do you think they're going to be crying out? The purple and the scarlet. My God, my God, why have you left me behind? They're being left behind. They weren't prepared. They weren't repentant. They weren't diligent. They weren't loving and seeking the Lord, loving their brothers and sisters. They weren't as Enoch was. These are incredible, incredible pieces to understand. But as you guys know, these are just the tip of the iceberg. Right? We were talking about even, um, uh, how about this one? We'll touch on, well, we can even touch on, I'll probably just be going all sorts of areas. So how about this one that we've talked on many times, Jonah? This is one that stumps everybody. How could they be the same story if in Luke chapter 11, with the story of Jonah, Jonah Jesus says he, as the son of man, is going to be a sign as Jonah was. Well, what kind of sign was Jonah? He was a 40-day warning to Nineveh. This hasn't happened yet. It was prophetic. It has not happened. When Christ resurrected from the dead, he wasn't going around warning for 40 days. When Jonah warned for 40 days, it was at the end of those 40 days, bang, they were going to be destroyed. Not 30-some years later, which wasn't even 40, by the way. You see? It never was fulfilled yet. This is what he's going to fulfill when he comes for 40 days after the escape and the wedding that's going to take place during the 50 days. How about when you go to Mark and you see the difference with the story of Jonah? This is where everybody gets stumped up. Listen to this. They sigh deeply and he says, why does this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, there shall be no sign given to this generation. 
and he left and entered in the ship and he left. People have never understood this. This is how powerful it is that I'm telling you right now. This has never been understood for centuries. People use these scriptures here to tell you that this book was written by men, not directed by the Spirit, and that it's corrupted because look at what Mark said. Well, how about what Matthew said? Matthew chapter 12. In Matthew chapter 12, he tells them that no sign shall be given except the, the sign of Jonah the prophet. And that Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. So shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So what has what the world of church told us? The world of church has said Jesus at his resurrection represented those 40 days. No, he didn't. Because he didn't do as Jonah did. And they'll tell you this was his when he was dead for three days and three nights. And what they'll tell you to justify it is that any part of one day and any part of another day is called a day. So even though it was really a day and a half, a little bit of one day, one full day, and a little bit of the next, that was three days. No, it wasn't. This doesn't say three days. It says three days and three nights. That means 72 hours plus. 72 hours is what that means. This was not fulfilled yet. How do we know? Because when you go to the story of the resurrection, the angel tells them. And this is why the, the, that video in the intros with the comma and is so important. He says, remember when he told you, listen to this, Luke 24, verse 7, that the Son of Man must be, so he said, saying, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men. That's the beginning. Comma and, meaning separation of events, but added together. Be crucified. Comma and, the third day rise again. You see, he wasn't three days and three nights in the grave. It was a little over a day and a half. There's no way to justify saying the third day he rose again when the entire story of the third day when he rose included him being taken into the hands of sinful men, being crucified, then being put in the grave and resurrected. That is not, even the entirety of these events was not a full three days and three nights, let alone being in the grave for a full three days and three nights. This has stumped people for centuries. But you know how it can be justified? Because everybody reads from the Gospel of Matthew. That's why that video on It's All Because of Matthew is so important. When your entire foundation is from Matthew, and it's written to the Jews, which most of the world knows, they're learning from the perspective of the Jews. So Christians that talk about pre-trib or mid-trib or post-trib, the reason they're doing it is because they're learning from Matthew and they're saying the seven years of tribulation is to the Jews. Well, they're right in where they're thinking. The only problem is because they never understood who Mark was, they think the tribulation is only seven and that they go pre-trib. You see, what they don't understand, that means they're at the end of Mark and Matthew's time is about to start. The end of Mark is the rapture of the great multitude between the sixth and the seventh seal. And when that's over, guess what happens? Seven years of trumpets is to Matthew. And that's why when you read at the end of Matthew's discourse or at the first portion at the end of Matthew 24, at the coming of the Son of Man, that is post-trip. But the group at the end of Mark were the ones that went in the great multitude rapture. That was the end of seals. The ones that go before it all begins is Luke's group. And that's why Luke's discourse is so much more different than Mark and then Matthew's. You see, let's have a quick look at Luke's discourse. 
in Luke chapter 21, there's a very, very, there's, there's more than one, but there's very key pieces to understand. You have black letter words here, and you have black letter words here. Both very important because they're telling you the time that these two pieces are connected to. So it says in black letter words, then he said unto them. It's like he's saying he said unto Mark's group and Matthew's group. Then he said unto them, nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Okay? Earthquakes, famines, all these things. But then what does Luke do? Luke 12, 21, 12, he jumps in and says, but before all these. Before all what? Before all this starts. Well, if you go to Mark's discourse, and even Matthew's for that matter, but if you go to Mark's discourse, listen to what it says. No red letter words. I mean, no black letter words. It's just simply Mark 13, 8, nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be earthquakes in diverse places, and there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. We've proven through scripture that this one verse is the first two and a half years of seals. It's World War III. It's the two and a half years before the other stuff begins, which is 42 months, 1260, time and times and half a time. You see, no black letter words. This is the beginning of the 14 years. Nation against nation will begin with the attack on Jerusalem at the end of the 50 days. Again, when we go back to Luke chapter 21 into his discourse, and we come down here to the other place where it says, and he spake unto them a parable. It says, behold the fig tree and all the trees. Well, this is about when they begin to sprout. And when they shoot forth, listen to this. When they now shoot forth, you see and know for your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. What does that mean? Near at hand. It's not summer yet, but it's near. Which means that one and this one beginning are at the same time. Do you know what that means? That means that the but before all these has to happen before summer. In fact, not only does it have to happen in the spring, this is also going to begin right before summer. It has to still be before summer because the clue is telling you that summer is near at hand. Isn't that exciting when you understand that we're in the 70th year right now and we'll talk about that? That this would be the beginning of the 50 days? This is the end of the 50 days, and look at how close summer is. It's near at hand. But only is it going to make a difference when you're actually in the 70th year, of course. But then you could keep going down into Luke, and there's no abomination of desolation because everything in this conversation in Luke is that. 50 to 40 days portion of the Son of Man being here, warning Jerusalem, probably the world, but also Jerusalem, that they're about to be compassed about by armies, which is the lion from the north. And when they are, everybody flee to the mountains, get out, don't let anybody else come in. Why? Because it's about to be destroyed. That's what it's telling you right here. You see, but the church who side with the Jews, which yes, we pray for the Jews and we strengthen and uplift the Jews. But the church, because they read everything from Matthew, have no clue that Jerusalem is about to be destroyed and they're gonna be removed for seven years. They think that, oh, they're gonna be attacked, sure. But they think that they're gonna be victorious because what are the Jews looking for? They're looking for their savior to come who's gonna defeat all their enemies and then rebuild the temple. Well, they're right. That is Messiah. 
coming at the end of the sixth year of six seal, at the end of six years of seals in that seventh year. It's going to be the Ezekiel 39 war at the end of the sixth seal, at the end of the sixth year, when he's coming on heavenly Mount Zion, will destroy all the enemies, will be the rapture of the great multitude, and then trumpet starts, and he's going to be there, and they're going to start rebuilding the temple. Unfortunately, the church has that mixed up with how everything's going to start. The church thinks that Antichrist is, is going to come first and he's going to be the one to build the temple. And the Jews are going to fall for him. We know that's not the case. See? They're going to be destroyed and they're going to be removed for seven years. Listen to what it says. For these be the days of vengeance that all these things which are written may be fulfilled. Wrath upon this people, distress in the land. They're going to be... Uh, fall by the edge of the sword, taken captive away into all nations until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled, which is what? The end of seals. Check this out. This is the pre-trib escape of the bride of Christ. Luke 21, starting in 34 through 36. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with the suffering and drunkenness and cares of this life, so that that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray always, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass, and to what? Stand in the wilderness? Be taken captive? No, to be accounted worthy to stand before the Son of Man. Who are the ones that will be accounted worthy? Who are the ones that get to be accounted worthy? All right, whoops, chapter 20. Luke chapter 20, the ones who get to be accounted worthy. And Jesus answering said unto them, the children of this world marry and are given in marriage, but they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage, neither can they die any more, for they are equal unto the angels. Do you think at the pre-trib escape, you're going to be equal unto the angels uh, standing before the Son of Man, not being able to die any more if you're going to be just escaping to the wilderness? No way. This is the pre-trib escape of the bride of Christ. When you get to Mark's discourse, when this, when this portion of Luke is done, the escape happens. It's the 50 days begins of which there's the seven days wedding from the last video. It's full detail about all of these things. You have the 40 days of the Son of Man. He's here as Jonah was. He warns as Jonah did, 40 days ends, three days to the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Then that group of workers goes out from Jerusalem and bam, Jerusalem is attacked. And then what starts? Mark 13, 8, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. All of this is only the first two and a half years of seals. It is World War III. You see, what else were we able to show from the difference in Mark compared to Matthew's? How about the abomination of desolation? You see, the difference for the wording is because one is a seal's one and one is a trumpet's one. Standing, the abomination of desolation is spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not. And it turns out when you go to the, gospel, uh, the book of Daniel, in chapter 11, it has one abomination of desolation. And in Daniel 12, it talks about another abomination of desolation. This first abomination of desolation is about placing something where it shouldn't be. Well, what does it represent? The time of Antichrist. Antichrist and the false prophet. And you had no mention of Antichrist or false prophet until the time of the abomination of desolation. It's going to be now the worst time than it ever was in human history. 
And what do we see? False Christs and false prophets now being mentioned, which was a wild revelation in itself because it wasn't mentioned in the first portion of Trump uh, of tribulation of seals because that's World War III. It's not until the time of the mark of the beast and the abomination of desolation. What does this represent in the time of the mark of the beast? Well, remember, it's still the time of the Gentiles. You see, seals is still the time of the church age. During the first two and a half years of tribulation and seals, it's going to be World War III, but it's going to be a time of the greatest revival in human history. So that when the mark of the beast time comes and the abomination comes, people will already know to flee from it and to escape from it, to not take it. Millions and millions will still die. Hundreds of millions will still die. But we know the vast majority at the time of the rapture will have survived. Hundreds of millions will have survived and fewer hundreds of millions will have died at the time of the rapture, of the great multitude rapture. What is this abomination of desolation? It's the mark of the beast. Well, what makes it different from Matthew's abomination of desolation? Matthew's abomination of desolation, the, the, the age of the Gentiles is over. Now it's trumpets in Matthew. And this abomination of desolation says, stand in the holy place. It's not placed where it ought not or standing where it ought not. And the difference between the two is one is about mid seals and one is about mid trumpets. Antichrist is against Christ. He's coming to destroy Christ's people. He's trying to take them all away. Satan is coming for God's people, the Jews. What's the difference between the two of them? There's no temple yet built during seals. Only the foundation will get laid because they've been removed from the land for seven years so it can rest. But during trumpets, it gets rebuilt during the first half of trumpets. And when Satan is cast down and the pit is open and Antichrist is brought back and all three of them are there, that's when he steps into the holy place, which is going to be the temple that will have been rebuilt in the first three and a half years of trumpets. This is proven to us by an incredible picture of Moses' temple compared to Solomon's temple. Okay? What was Moses' temple that represents the time of seals? It was made of skins. You see? It was made of skins. What are you made of? Skin, right? Flesh covered what? Flesh covered a portable temple. What are we? A skin, flesh covered portable temple that God dwells in. And during the age of the Gentiles, the Lord is going to be dwelling in this temple. So what do you think is going to happen during Mark's abomination of desolation. It's the mark of the beast. It's the mark of the beast. The one for Matthew is after the temple had been built when the Gentile age is now over and it's the seven years of trumpets and the Lord is there on Zion and the temple is being rebuilt while there's a war with Michael and his angels and Satan and his angels before he loses and is cast down. What will have been built during the first half of trumpets? The third temple. This is why the Jews aren't going to fall for the Antichrist. They're going to be destroyed and be fleeing. But they'll recognize when the Lord comes, when Messiah comes at the end of seals, because he's going to destroy the enemies that came against them and against his people around the world. And it's going to be him there with the Zerubbabel type overseeing the, the, the rebuilding of the temple. You see how the confusion has taken place? When you go back into Mark chapter 13 in his discourse, you see here this abomination of desolation, which is the time of the mark of the beast. So if the first portion of seals is World War III, 
and lasts about two and a half years, then when the abomination of desolation happens because the Antichrist and false prophet are now there, what do you think that does then to Revelation 13? You see? When the Antichrist fully steps on the scene and gets his power, who does he... We know that Satan gives him his power and his authority, but look at who he has control of. The leopard. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, what is it? Um, the leopard, the bear, and the lion. So the, this beast, this antichrist beast, is the leopard, the bear, and the lion. And what is he going to be given? He's going to be given power to continue 42 months. When he gets his power, what's going to happen? The mark of the beast. The mark of the beast comes. So that means when the mark of the beast comes about, he's here on the scene. He's being shown as the guy. Why is so much of the world going to fall for him? Because they just endured three, uh, two and a half years of a literal global World War III in the midst of famines, troubles, which is roilings of water, so tsunamis, famines, major earthquakes ripping the earth apart in places. But at the end of his 42 months, what happens? Well, for that, we can go to Daniel chapter 7. You see, what do we read about in Daniel chapter 7? The first beast is the lion. This is the one that's going to destroy, as Assad, who's going to destroy Jerusalem. Then you've got the bear. So they're all independently working during World War III. Because it's nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom during the first two and a half years. So you have the lion bringing about destruction in Jerusalem and Middle East war breaking out fully. Then you've got the bear, Russia. Given probably working with China, but this is Russia. And that'll bring war to the nations. And then you've got the leopard. And the leopard is the control center where everything is going to be kind of organized, if you will, which is probably going to be Germany or somewhere up there in Europe. But when is the fourth beast? Right here. There's your fourth beast. Which means these three are operating independently in World War III, whether together independently causing World War III all over the world, not like World War II. This will actually be throughout the whole earth. But when does the fourth beast show up? There he is, after the other three, which means those first three were all part of World War III first, before you can get to Revelation 13, where this beast takes over all of them and has the, the authority and the voice of the lion in, in the Middle East, has the army of Russia and has the control over in Europe or in Germany uh, specifically. This power that he's going to have, we know from Revelation 13, is going to last three and a half years or 42 months. Which will take it to the end of the first six years of tribulation. Which is the end of the sixth seal. What do we see happen at the end of the sixth seal? We see the son of man and the lamb, right? Or uh, um, the one sitting on the throne and the ram and the time, uh, the lamb, sorry, and the time of the lamb's wrath. What do you see in Daniel 7? The Ancient of Days now did come. Okay? And what happened? The beast, the Antichrist, was killed. He was killed, but the rest of them, like the false prophet, wasn't killed. And all the other ten, the ten toes and everything, they weren't killed, but all their dominion was taken away. But the beast, he was. His body destroyed and given to the burning flame. And then what happens? Then one like unto the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven to the Ancient of Days, and the dominion was given to him. 
This is at the end of six years of seals. This is at the end of the Ezekiel 39 war. <clears throat> this is why the Jews will recognize them. You see, this is exactly what you read at the end of the sixth seal. So when you go back now into Mark, and you go into Mark 13, look at what we read in Mark 13. There's your abomination of desolation, which was all about the mark of the beast, antichrist and false prophet. It's going to be the worst time in human history in that second half of seals. And then you have the coming of the Son of Man. Okay? This is the Lord coming at the end of the sixth year of seals, just like you read at the end of the sixth seal. And now when we go to Matthew, remember this teaching, it was such an exciting one. When you go to Matthew's discourse, and we see this abomination of desolation, or before the abomination of desolation, remember in Mark's first half of, of his, before the abomination of desolation, there was no mention of false prophets or false Christ. It was only after at the time of the abomination of desolation. But we know at the end of seals, only Antichrist is killed. But the others have their dominions taken away. So now we're at the first half of trumpets in Matthew 24. And guess what? Only false prophet is mentioned in the first half of the, of the discourse. Why? Because Antichrist was killed. Pretty wild, right? And then what happens? Then there's going to be the abomination of desolation. This will be after the third temple will have been built, the, the actual physical third temple. While the Lord was here. This is where Messiah gets cut off. And they now fly away on the wings of an eagle for the time and times and half a time. Because Satan has lost his battle in heaven and him and his angels have been cast down. The pit is opened. And when the pit is opened, Antichrist is coming back. So guess what happens after the abomination of desolation in Matthew 24? False Christ and false prophets are back. This is 100% directly related to the revelation in Revelation chapter 17, where we read about the beast in verse, eight, in verse 8 of Revelation 17 that says, The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. What does it mean was? For 42 months, the second half of seals, he was. For the first half of trumpets, he is not because he was killed at the end of seals. So for the first half of trumpets, he is not. At mid-trumpets, when the pit is open and he ascends out, he shall be again. He was, is not, and shall be. This is why you see when you get to Revelation 16, in relation to the bulls, as I mentioned earlier in verse 13, that it says, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. How was that possible if Antichrist was killed at the end of his 42 months? Because Revelation 17 told you when Satan's cast down and the pit is open, he's coming out. So it was bad. As awful as it said it was going to be since the creation of the earth in Mark's discourse at the midpoint when Antichrist gets that power, when Matthew's mid portion comes at this abomination of desolation, this is going to be the actual standing in the holy place, and that holy place is going to be the rebuilt third temple. Do you think Jews are going to fall for this guy? Do you think Jews are going to fall for Satan and the Antichrist coming up out of the pit? No. Do you know why? Because they already fled away on the wings of eagles, remember? Watch this. In Revelation chapter 12, we discussed this in the last video. The escape of the bride of Christ happens before verse 2. The travailing in birth is the Son of Man here for 40 days. And the pain to be delivered is literally that piece from Mark 13, verse 8, that equals the first two and a half years of seals, which is World War III. 
Then, there you go. Dragon giving power and authority to the Antichrist for 42 months. There's your third of the stars, the early fig tree cast to the earth at the sixth seal. And then what do you see? The Son of Man coming. The Son of Man is coming at the end of the sixth seal. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up. This is the great multitude rapture in between the sixth seal and the seventh seal, which will happen in the seventh year of tribulation. Then what happens? Then there's the fleeing into the wilderness, right, by this place prepared for 1260 days. What is happening during these 1260 days, which is the first half of trumpets now? Okay, now you're at the first half of trumpets. These 1260 days are the first half of trumpets, and it's proven to us in Revelation 11. And the court that is without tree trampled of the Gentiles shall be tread underfoot 42 months. How long is the Antichrist going to tread the Gentiles underfoot? Right? Going to tread those that have the Christ inside for 42 months. When the 42 months is over, he's giving power to his two witnesses to prophesy for 1260 days. Remember what he said when the 1260 days is over? Verse, Revelation 11, verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit. When does the beast ascend out of the bottomless pit? Like I just showed you. At the abomination of desolation. When is that? When they finish their testimony. When do they finish their testimony? When their 1260 days is done, which is the first half of trumpets. How do we know that? Because it's at the first woe. Look at this. Go to Revelation 9, verse 1. And the fifth angel sounded. That's the first woe. The last three trumpets are woe, woe, woe. So at the first woe, which is about three and a half years into trumpets or ten and a half years since tribulation began, the pit is opened. If the pit is opened and he's now going to make war against them after they finish their 1260 days, and now he's going to make war against them, that means the first half of trumpets was the 1260 days. So you had two and a half years of just each one in their World War III. Antichrist gets that power and authority, takes control over the whole thing, and the world being in such desperation, in famine, in death, in, in, in craziness that they're going to go through in the midst of the greatest revival in human history, which is why the Lord's allowing it, Antichrist shows up and gets that power. Most of the world will accept that mark. Most of the world will, will worship him. And the reason is because they can't take the suffering anymore. They can't take what they've seen. Imagine all the world's wars in the was and in the is that have already taken place throughout earth. Now imagine that none of them compare to what's about to happen. Because at no time in human history were there this many people on the earth since the flood. In all of those wars. And this time it's the entire planet. Every other one was somewhat regional. Even World War II. This is the entire world. That's why most are going to believe them. You see? So we've got the two and a half years of World War III. He gets his power to continue for 42 months. The Lord returns on heavenly Mount Zion, not feet down, not the whole world seeing him everywhere, but comes on heavenly Mount Zion. The whole world freaks out seeing this coming. They hide into the rocks. The Lord destroys the enemies. The great multitude rapture comes in. Okay, the great multitude rapture comes in. Then we know there's the 40, uh, the 1262 days, or the 1260 days after the 42 months. Those 1260 days is also the length of time that a war 
is going to be taking place in heaven between Michael and his angels and the dragon and his. When those 1260 days are over, they're being cast down to the earth, and that's when the pit is going to be opened up. It even tells you that it's the woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Because now he has a great wrath and he knows what? He knows that his time is short. So at this point, you're at mid trumpets. So you had the 42 months, you've had the 1260. Now what do you have? Now you have his short period of time, but his short period of time is in the last three and a half years of trumpets or the last three and a half years of the 14 years. But we know that it's not all of them, right? Watch this. This woman flying into the, into the wilderness on the wings of a great eagle isn't just the Gentiles, you know, those that were saved and so forth. The rapture group's already in paradise. So this relates to the tribes and everybody else. Because when he defeated them at the end of the sixth seal, the Jews recognized who he was because that's who they're waiting for. Who's going to destroy all the enemies and then rebuild the temple. So when he destroys the enemies and he rebuilds the temple, don't you think that what they've been watching and praying and seeking for thousands of years, for, well, almost 2,000 years, they're going to recognize it when they've been passing it generation to generation? They're going to recognize it. And they're going to be a part of the rapture group, but not going to paradise. They're going to go in after them, and they're going to Jerusalem at the end of those seven years. And so three and a half years later, after those 1260 days are done, after the rebuilding of the third temple, when Satan is now cast down, there's only three and a half years are left. And that's called a time, comma, and times comma and half a time that's three and a half years that's one plus two plus a half that's three and a half years those three and a half years will take you to the end of the 14 years but guess what that's not all satan's short time satan was given a short time he knows that his time is short but he doesn't get all final three and a half years, of which Antichrist is now back to, right? Could you just imagine what that's going to be like? Satan cast down to the earth, his fallen angels with him, the pit open, Anti uh, Antichrist coming back, and whatever else. Just imagine what mid trumpet is going to be like. Thank goodness for being able to take these guys away for the last three and a half years. Okay, what ends up happening during those three and a half years takes us right back to Daniel. In Daniel chapter 12, when they're asking, right, we talked about this in Daniel in the previous videos. When Daniel is talking and the angel says, man, how long is this going to last? Right. The man clothed with linen, Daniel 12, 6. And one said to the man clothed with linen which was upon the waters of the rivers. How long shall it be till the end of these wonders? And he lift up his right hand and so forth. And he says that it shall be for a time, times and a half. There's no and here, but there's an and here, which means this isn't an addition. It means one, two plus a half. That's two and a half years. That's two and a half years, which means out of the final three and a half years, only two and a half are the short period of time that Satan's going to get. Pretty wild, right? So what happens in that final year? Watch this. Go to Daniel 9. And in Daniel 9, we see the first seven weeks, which are seven years. And there's nothing mentioned about it. Because this is a conversation to the Jews. The first seven years, they were removed from the land comma, and, meaning plus three score in two weeks, which is about three and a half years. And what does it say? The, the streets and the walls shall be built again, even in troublous times. Until what? Till the end of those three and a half years, approximately, and then Messiah is cut off. 
This isn't Messiah Antichrist. This is the Messiah. Because the city and the streets were being rebuilt and the temple in the first three and a half years. Why is he cut off? Because the people, the prince that are coming to destroy. It's when the pit is opened up. Remember what it said? In Revelation 12, he's going to go after them with a flood. So when, he's, when Satan's cast down and the pit is open, he's going to go after them with a the flood, knowing that his time is short. He goes after them with a the flood. The earth is going to open, and they're flying away on wings of an eagle for the time and times and half a time. So now they're gone. So what is he going to do now? He's turning his attention to bring about a war against who? Just like Revelation 11 said. He's going to make war against the two witnesses. And the two witnesses, that war is going to last two and a half years. How do you know it's going to last two and a half years? Because they're killed at the end of the sixth trumpet and then resurrected after what? Well, isn't that interesting? After three and a half full days. Interesting, right? Remember Matthew's Jonah story after three days and after three nights in the heart of the earth means sometime on the fourth day. Just so happens the two witnesses are doing that. All right. So how long is this war going to last? Two and a half years. Because when you go to Revelation 11, at the end of that sixth trumpet, when they when they resurrect, what happens? Seventh trumpet is about to blow. And if you go to Revelation 10, it tells you that when the seventh trumpet, the last trumpet is about to sound, just as the lips are going to it, it says the mystery shall be finished. What mystery shall be finished? What mystery of the end shall be finished? Right here. Because Satan's time to the end of tribulation, or the three and a half, only two and a half years did Satan have. And it's Yeshua Messiah returning feet down on the Mount of Olives at the end of those two and a half years or at the end of the 13 years, seven of seals, six of trumpets. And what happens? Well, there's your unto the end of the war. Desolations are determined. This end of the war is the war against the two witnesses for two and a half years. Which leaves what? One week of years left. One year left. This is Messiah confirming the covenant that he made at the end of seals to the start of trumpets. It's absolutely mind-blowing to, to be able to see and to understand these things, guys. It's fulfilled everywhere. You see, a lot of people like to go to this one, and they're right. Because it's an easy one. Zechariah chapter 14 is the day of the Lord when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives to bring about the second destruction with Satan and those that were with him. And then Satan is bound for a thousand years. You see, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib are all true. It's Luke, it's Mark, it's Matthew. It's it's one of our famous ones where the revelation of the 14 years first came to be understood. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2. I knew a man in Christ. Those who are in Christ are those that Romans 8, 1 tells us, that there's no condemnation for them. They're not living after the flesh. They're living by the Spirit, even though we're walking around in fleshly bodies. We're walking by the Spirit, living by the Spirit. Who are these people? They are the ones that are led by the Spirit of God. They are the sons of God. When we went to the creation story, remember we said the first creation portion was what? The Spirit of God. What did Romans just say? They're the ones that have the Spirit of God. They are the sons of God. They're part of the gap theory creation that we've proven is a typology of seven days as well, or 7,000 years. But it's also a picture of a very short period of time because the Lord was excited 
to create. He was excited to start building the spirit portion creation. This is the Romans 8 portion of people, those that are spirit filled, that are the co heirs with Christ and children of God. Remember what it said? If so be that we suffer with them. Are you ready, 14ers? You see? It's, it's absolutely everywhere. <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter 12 again. So you have in Christ, but what did you get? Above 14 years ago. That's what the last video was all about. Those 50 days are the revelation of above 14 years. It's 50 days, 14 years, and the 50th Jubilee. The Lord returns at the end of 13. He fulfills that 14th year, and then the millennial reign begins. So that means he's here in that final year, destroying all the enemies that came against. And then what happens? All those that were in the wilderness till the end of the Revelation 12, time and times and half a time, they're all brought back at the end of the final year of Zechariah 14. And when they're brought back, it'll be the final Jubilee, the 50th Jubilee year, and they will all be forgiven their debts. They will all receive their land back. Everything they were promised will now begin. Look at this. What happens to this group above 14 years in this typology that Paul is representing? They're a group that's going to be like a rapture, like a caught up. <coughs> Excuse me, they go to the third heaven. This is where the pre-trib group is going that we believe is going to happen by next Friday. They go at the beginning of the 50 days. Then you see, and I knew such a man. So like, again, the word like this one, but not the same in Christ. It's too late to be in Christ after the pre-trib escape happens. But they're still kind of like them, right? They, they love the Lord. They've accepted him. They've repented. Okay? So it's such a man. And where does this one go? Was caught up to paradise. This is the great multitude rapture of Revelation chapter 7. It's uh, Revelation chapter 12, verse 5, the was caught up. And then look at what you see. He's then talking to them as the Lord, right? The typology with Paul. And he's saying, behold, the third time I'm ready to come to you. Now he's talking to the Jews. I'm coming to you now this third time. So it was a taking, a taking, and a return. A pre, a mid, a post. He's not going to be burdensome to them, right? You're the parents. You have to lay up for the children, right? Because they're the ones that knew. They were the Lord's people. They were the chosen ones. They passed down the scriptures and so forth for generations and for thousands of years. They were laying up for us. But their glory of their promise. Do you know the scriptures say that as magnificent, and this is almost hard to believe, right? That as magnificent as it is going to be in the third heaven for those pre-trib, and as glorious as it's going to be in paradise for the mid-trib people, it says that what he has planned for them in their time, in their promise, which is the millennial reign with Christ, says it's going to be even more glorious. Try to imagine that. It's supposed to be even more glorious. They're going to have a greater wow. Could you imagine than that than being in the third heaven? Heck no. <laughs> third heaven, baby. I'm ready for the third heaven. Let's go. I can't even imagine what that means. That their promise of their heaven on earth. Right? Their kingdom of heaven is the heaven on earth. Ours is the kingdom of God. It's hard to even consider the, the depth of what that means. You see, it's all about the was, the is, the is to come. The was and the is are all typologies in the is to come. <clears throat> How about this spectacular revelation? Okay, we've just recently touched on this one and we've done many videos on it since the revelation of it. This is the spirit group. After the spirit group, 
the, the Lord is made light. The Father makes him light. You go, to, you go to Genesis 2, and after the day's creation, God forms man. Well, Jesus is called the, the last Adam. <clears throat> so he's got a connection in the typology to Adam, right? And this is when flesh was created. So what did you have? You had the word, which is the spirit group. You had him then being made light, which is the mark group. The first one is the Luke group. The, the light group is the mark group. And then the Matthew group is the flesh. And we're living in there thousands of years since the flesh began. It's crazy. To discern and to be able to understand that. <clears throat> and we were able to show it from John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. Right? The beginning was Christ and the beginning was Father in Taurus at Resurrection Day, which is called the beginning. Christ is the beginning. He is the first fruits beginning. That was how we got the revelation that it was the feast of first fruits, the 50 days before feast of weeks, when the 14 years begin at the red horse rider. So what do you have? The beginning was the word, right? It was the spirit portion. And listen to this. In the beginning was the word, so Christ, right? The same was the beginning, was in the beginning, with God. That's the Father. So you had both of them there in the beginning. One was Taurus, one was, was, um, one was first fruits. In the beginning, that was the beginning. It was first fruits on the very first word of in the beginning. It happened at first fruits in Taurus. But of course, now the sun is off by two months. Crazy, right? Well, what happened after the beginning? Jesus was made light. John even tells us. After he was made light, what does John say? He was made flesh. What's the story? Spirit, right? Holy Ghost, Son, and Father. What was the creation story? The Spirit of God first, then he was made light, and then Adam was flesh. Adam is the fleshly, first is the fleshly, right? The soul, then the other one is a quickening spirit. And that was Christ in the flesh. Wild, wild, wild things. And you want to know what this here in John really helped us to open up the creation story. But there were a couple other parts that were revealing themselves to us along the way. Like in Genesis chapter 29. <laughs> I told you guys, I had, I had my 70 tabs opened to, to put this all together for you guys this afternoon. I haven't even gone to my tabs. <laughs> I told you, man, if this isn't spirit-led, I, 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 I don't know what to tell you. If you can't see that this is spirit-led, you're just not paying attention. <laughs> it's over the top. I could do this in my sleep. It's craziness. Look at the story of Jacob. This is where a lot of the picture began years ago for us. You see, we know that Jacob, he was going to work for Rachel, and he says, I'll serve these seven years for Rachel. And what happens in verse in Genesis 29, verse 20, he says he served seven years. OK. Think of that first creation of two verses, that spirit group. OK, it literally if we were there in, in the in the dimension of time that we're in and we saw those first two verses of Genesis one, verse one and two. It would have been seven thousand years to us in time. To the Lord God, it would have been seven days. But we're only given two verses in the glimpse. And you know why? Because the Lord was so excited to create that there's only a little blip of info there. It's the exact same story here with Jacob. It says he served seven years. Why? For Rachel, they seemed unto him but a few days for the love that he had for her. So see, it was seven years, or it was 7,000 years in that gap theory creation. But because of the Lord's joy and excitement to create, it only seemed but a few days. And to us, in the revelation of the is to come, what does it represent? What does it represent? It represents this piece right here. Those that are in Christ 
above 14 years. It, it was seven years that we've been in. Okay, the end of days is a story of seven years, seven years, seven years, and the final jubilee. But the seven years we've been in, they're they're easy, right? It's they're easy in comparison to tribulation, right? Compared to seals and trumpets, this is easy, regardless of what we went through. In in a world picture, the key part in those seven years is a period of days called fifty days that are above. And they represent the spirit group because they're the ones in Christ. And the ones in Christ we just saw in Romans 8 are the ones that are spirit filled in Christ. They're the co-heirs with Christ. They're directly connected to that creation gap theory that was 7,000 if we were there. That was seven days to the Lord. But then in the typology flew by as days representing 50 in the end of days, which represents Luke's portion and that 50 days of Luke's discourse. Just as the Son of Man will be here. Wild, wild, over-the-top, mind-blowing stuff. Well, let's keep going. Then what does it say? Then with uh, Jacob, where am I? He worked those seven years and it only felt like days. Then he has what? Well, then he, he gets married, right? And there's a feast. Hello. And after the wedding feast, he finds out he was duped. He was beguiled by his father-in-law. You got to remember this, guys. It's the same typology that plays out with us. It's not that the Lord hates us. It's not that the Lord doesn't want his Gentile bride. It's typologies because Christ isn't coming for those who are already saved. He's coming for the lost and those who weren't prepared. You follow? The spirit group is going to be taken. But his portion was the light group. Remember, he's the light and he's coming as light. And he's to share the light and give it to the disciples to spread the light throughout the earth during seals. He really wants his Rachel. So he was what? He was beguiled. And he says, look, Laban says, look, I can't give you the younger one before the firstborn. Hello. Who are the firstborn represented by, guys? The first fruits, right? The first fruits. Those who are in Christ's spirit filled. Just like the creation. They were the first ones. <coughs> Excuse me. They were the ones that were older. They were a part of the first creation. The spirit group. That's the typology. Who's the younger one? The ones that were in the creation of days. The light group after he was made light. The males and females that were created in the days. So what happens? He fulfills the week wedding. And then he says, look, I'll give you Rachel, but what? He still had to work seven more years for her. These seven years are the seven years of seals. Who does he get at the end of the seven years of seals? Rapture of the great multitude, the house of Israel, the sleeping church, the world, those that, that were lost, the ones that he came for. Pretty crazy, right? This represents those in the creation of Genesis 1 who were represented by when he was made light. And it was what? Days. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven days. All right? Into Genesis 2. Seven days. Which proves that this created male and female was another creation from Adam and Eve, separate. Because this was the light group. Remember, spirit, light, then flesh. The, the spirit's group, the son's group, the father's group. So, then what happened? Well, if you go into Genesis from there, you go to Genesis 31, and you see the time that he worked with his father-in-law. He says, thus I have been 
20 years in thy house and served you 14 years. Now, this isn't the same 14 years we talk about. This was the seven easy years that I was telling you about that we're in right now coming to an end. And then it's seven years of seals. And he got what? Leah, who is the older one, which is represented by the spirit group. And at the end of the seven years of seals, he gets his Rachel group. And then what does it say? He worked six more years for the cattle, which yes, is represented as the Judah, as the flesh group. And what does it represent? 20 years. Seven years before tribulation begins, seven years of seals, six years of trumpets. Well, how about that? What happens at the end of the six years of trumpets or the end of 13 years? Seven years of seals, six years of trumpets before what? The Lord returns, feet down on the Mount of Olives. So the Lord returns, feet down on the Mount of Olives in the same 20th year or after 20 years at the 21st year. 20 years is complete. So you could say at the end of 20 or at the start of 21, same thing, which is the equivalent of seven easy years, seven years of seals, six years of trumpets. And what does he do with his father-in-law? He makes a covenant with them. What does Daniel chapter 9 tell us? Daniel chapter 9 in that final year, that final one year, week as a year, he does what? He destroys all the abominations that have taken place. And what does he do? He confirms the covenant with many. Why does he confirm the covenant with many? Because it was Christ that made the covenant at the end of seals to the start of trumpets. But he had to break it because Satan was cast down. Hello. I just showed you right there. That's when he made a covenant. At the end of the 20 or at the end of the 13th year, at the start of the 14th year. <clears throat> it's literally the exact same storyline given in all of these types and shadows. We showed you the same thing with the story of Abraham. Remember Abraham, they have Ishmael. Ishmael is called affliction and a wild man, right? He's represented, you could say, as, um, as the raven, which means Arab, okay? Probably the one connected to Syria with, um, uh, uh, with Assad. And what happens? Well, follow the storyline. Abraham was 86 years old when he had Ishmael. Then what happens? He's 99 years old, 13 years later. And what does God do? Well, how about that? He makes a covenant. He makes a covenant with him and his household. And it even tells you when he makes this covenant of the circumcision with them, it says that we know that Abraham was now 99, which means after 13 years, and Ishmael was 13 years old. And then what happened? And then in chapter 21, when Abraham is 100 years old, 14th year, the promise of Isaac, the typology of Jesus shows up, which is just like the Lord returning feet down on the Mount of Olives when it's all done. You see how crazy this is? See how beautiful it is? The was shall be, the is shall be. All we need to do is understand the revelation of the end. Is it an easy thing? <clears throat> Absolutely not. It's been hidden for centuries, actually for thousands of years since before the creation and was reserved for this time of the end. It's, it, it's so incredible. How about this? Um, how about that difference with the Antichrist and Satan? Okay. Let me show you with, with the, the whole day's creation. Okay. When we were talking about this with the day's creation, we saw that uh, they were created, right? Male and female. And it was, let us make them in, the, in our image. Okay. We know that this is where the corruption came. And how do we know this? 
Romans chapter 1, there's other places, but Romans chapter 1 tells us. Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 21, says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified, not, they glorified him not as God. Neither were they thankful, but became vain. See, they became vain. If you go look up image in Genesis chapter 1, when they created the males and females in there, and they said in our image, which was light, they corrupted them. And you look at the word image, and it means a vain show, right? In the similitude, a shadow. That's not the Lord. Okay? There was a corruption that took place. So they glorified not, right? In their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Listen to this. This is how you know it's the beginning from Genesis 1. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man, given over to lust and worshiping what? And they worshiped the creature more than the creator. The creature, the creature is all a representation of the Mark group. This Mark group, this, this lost sheep, the ones that he's coming for, <clears throat> the one that seals is all about. The world that is lost, that he's coming to save from the great multitude, the greatest revival in human history. They're the ones represented as the creature that got corrupted. That creature was the creation in the days. Pretty wild, right? In fact, when you go look up the word creature, you're going to find it. It's in Mark's gospel. How, how can we prove all these things out? Well, listen to this. 2 Peter 3.8 is, is the other piece after the, um, the Jacob story and, and John 1 and what started to be revealed in Genesis creation stories. This was a major piece right here. In 2 Peter 3.8, Paul says, Beloved, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. That's a pretty strong statement, wouldn't you say? Do not be ignorant of this one thing. Maybe we should pay attention. That one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. Comma and. A thousand years is as one day. Remember I told you how important the comma and was? It's so important. I've got a video in the intro series talking about the comma with the word and. It is massively important because what it means is this a day is with the Lord as a thousand is one thing in addition to a thousand years is as one day. What does this mean? One day as a thousand and a thousand as one day. Okay. So that means if we go to where we find one day in creation, <clears throat> Oh, there we go. One day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day. Go to Genesis 2 and the seventh day. Well, they were there with the Lord. So one day with the Lord is as a thousand years. Because we're living in the dimension of time. When the days of creation were done, were, they, were made, there were, we weren't in the dimension of time. Those creations of days were to the Lord God as days. But if time had been there and we were in the dimension of time seeing that happen, it means it would have taken place over thousands of years, 7,000 years. That's exactly, literally what 2 Peter 3.8 said. A day is with the Lord as a thousand years. Which means these seven days of creation would have been to us as a thousand years each. And then what did he say? A thousand years is to the Lord as one day. Well, when did the thousand years begin? In the actual thousands of time. When the Lord God, when the Lord God Father created Adam. We've been living in the literal thousands ever since Adam, 
which is the portion of time to Matthew, the portion of time to the Jews. Why do you think everything was chosen to the Jews? They're his people, they're his people. They defile, he brings them back. They defile, he brings them back. They're disobedient, he brings them back. Why are we to pray for the Jews? We're living in their portion of time. Hello. That's the big mystery picture behind it all. We're living in their thousands of years flesh portion of time. So if we're living in this fleshly portion of time of thousands of years, the Lord said, comma, and each of these thousands to the Lord is as a day each. Which means the first seven days of creation was a portion of creation that to us would appear to 7,000. And the 7,000 that we're in right now would have been unto the Lord as seven days, which means what? Seven and seven. Seven days to the Lord, seven days to the Lord, 7,000 it would have been to us, and 7,000 that we're living in now. One portion is the Mark group, the other portion is the Matthew group. One is the light group, one is the flesh group. The second time, the second portion of Christ in the, in the creation was light. When Christ came, what did he say? I'm coming for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and he's coming to what? He's coming to shed his light. And the disciples are to shed light. And when, when he comes for this group in the end of days, he's coming as light to send light throughout the earth in, in the midst of darkness. And then when he comes at the end of seals, what's at the time? Time of trumpets, time of flesh. So what do you have? Seven days, seven days to the Lord. 7,000 to us it would have been to 7,000 that we're living in. What's the end of days? Seven years and seven years. But there was a little blip of portion at the beginning, wasn't there? This blip of portion is the spirit group. This blip of portion is the above 14 years. This blip of portion is Jacob working seven or seven years or 7,000 or seven days to the Lord, but flew by as days. Flew by quickly because it's that final portion, that final Luke 50-day piece that's really the beginning of it all. Craziness. Who brought the deception here in the creation of days? The sun and the moon. Because the sun and the moon are the ones that fell from the firmament with some of the planets. They were all created in the firmament. They're the responsible ones in the typology of the Antichrist and the false prophet. When we go to the creation of flesh and the corruption happened in the flesh, who was the one that corrupted the flesh? Satan, right? The serpent. The serpent was the one that corrupted the flesh. So it means you had the one who was brilliantly covered, right? You have one that was so arrayed, you could say like the sun. So you got the sun and the moon that fell. You've got the Antichrist and the false prophet. But at mid trumpets, representing Satan, is the serpent, the dragon, the devil. Well, guess what? A lot of people, like I said earlier, combine them together. We know they're not together. Watch this. Let's go to... Eggs, uh, Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 28. In Ezekiel chapter 28, <clears throat> listen to this. Look at this. Starting in verse 7. Behold, therefore, I will bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their sword against thee, uh, against thy beauty of thy wisdom, and they shall defile thy brightness. Who was the one brought as brightness? Who was the anointed? Cherub. The cherub. Do you know that the cherubim are the ones that are around the throne of Christ? The cherub were the ones around the throne of Christ. 
and the most glorious one was Lucifer, who was the most splendid, covered, brightest one. Pretty crazy, right? And he fell. Well, do you know that cherubim, that there's also seraphim? If we go to Isaiah chapter 6, look at what we read about in Isaiah 6. Uh, verse, oh, we can see verse 1. I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. What is the seraphim? You ready for this? Serpent. The seraphim surround the throne of God. The cherubim surround the, front, the throne of Jesus. Which means Lucifer fell from the cherub around Christ and the seraphim from around the throne of the Father. One is Lucifer, one is Satan. One is the representation of the Antichrist. The other is the representation of Satan. Do you realize that there is no way that if they were the same, that in Revelation 16 that I was sharing with you earlier, that they could actually be all there, seen as, as spirits like frogs coming out of their mouths at their destruction? How, how could the Antichrist and the false prophet be thrown into the lake of fire and when the millennial reign is done satan when he's released one final time is also thrown into the lake of fire where they are do you understand the confusion you've been taught all of these years talk about confusion right and it was right here in the word seraphim and cherubim one like the sun, right? Bright and arrayed like the sun, and the other one like a serpent. Wild stuff, man. These are all things that have been revealed in five and a half years. You see, and this is just, we're just scraping the surface of these things that we've been given to understand. We have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of things that have been revealed. How about this? <clears throat> you see, this has always been so important, 70 years, right? Now, we do believe that the one related here in Daniel, these 70 weeks or 70 years, which relate to the Feast of Weeks when you search it up, is related specifically to Jerusalem. That at the end of the 14 years will be the 70 years of Jerusalem. Well, guess what? That's exactly what it is. It's exactly what it is. Jerusalem, you see, when the seventh trumpet is over, when the seventh year of trumpets is over, that final 14th year is done, it'll be around spring, summertime, right? Feast of weeks of 2037. When did they come into the land? I mean, uh, when did they get Jerusalem? 1967. What? What? From Feast of Weeks 2023 to Feast of Weeks 2037 is 14 years. And in Daniel, excuse me, in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, these 70 weeks of Feasts of Weeks are to bring about the end of all of their punishment and the desolations upon Jerusalem. And the 14 years is over when the 70 is over. This is exactly <clears throat> what all of this is. It's the revelation of the 14 years of Jerusalem or of the end of days. The second half, which is all focused on their portion of time. And the first seven not being spoken about because it's what's coming to the world. 
This is what we're shown <clears throat> in Leviticus 26. For their Jews, not their obedience, but for their disobedience. He's going to bring a terror, a consumption. He's going to punish them what? Seven times. To break their pride. He's going to punish them what? Seven times. He's going to send wild beasts among them. For what? I will punish you what? Yet seven times. I will bring the sword upon you. That shall offend the quarrel of my covenant. <clears throat> and when they are gathered together within your cities, I will send the plague or the pestilence. Remember Daniel chapter 20, uh, Matthew chapter 24. Right. The sword and the plague. The plague among you and shall deliver you into the hand of your enemies. I will chastise you seven times. You shall eat the flesh of your sons and of your daughters. Yikes. I will scatter you among the heathen and will draw out a sword after you and your land shall be desolate and your cities laid waste. Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbaths as long as it lieth desolate and ye be in your enemy's land. Even then shall the land rest and enjoy her Sabbaths for as long as it lieth desolate, it shall rest because it did not rest in your Sabbaths. You see, they never allowed the land to rest since they've had Jerusalem. They've never truly been obedient to the things they were supposed to do. So he's going to now remove them for seven years. He's going to remove them for seven years. So when you see Daniel 70, that's the 70 counting to the end of the 70 of Jerusalem. When you go to Zechariah chapter 1, guess what you see? Verse 12. Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long will thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and the cities of Judah against which you have had indignation these 70 years? <clears throat> what does he say? I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy. I am very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease, for I was a little displeased, and they helped forward the affliction. When? These 70 years. You go to Revel uh, Zechariah chapter 7, and when I was talking about earlier, this strange thing that revealed itself over the years that we call chapters to years, there's only two books in the entire Bible that have 14 chapters. And Zechariah is written to the Jews and Hosea is written to the house of Israel slash Gentiles, which is represented by the Mark group, the world. There's 14 chapters and throughout both of them, they have typologies within the entirety of 14 years of events that will take place. That's why Zechariah 1 saying these 70 years is so important. You get to Zechariah 7, it's all past tense and says those 70 years. Which means for 70 years, since they've been in Israel, <coughs> of which we needed to count to understand, right? So we're not talking here now about Jerusalem 70 that comes at the end of the 14. We're talking about the 70 of Israel that comes at the start of the 14. The 70 that comes to an end at the start of the 14 years. And this is where you see it. Uh, this in Zechariah. This is all past tense. And for 70 years that they've been in the land, they inhabited the land. They were in prosperity. They inhabited the south of the plain. But this tells us they only did it for 70 years. In Zechariah 1, representing seven years earlier, tells us that it was these 70 years. So, do you understand that it's important that you need to discern, we need it to understand <coughs> how on earth could it be 70 years from when they came into the land if you count from 1948? That would have been the end of what, 2017? <coughs> Excuse me. 
right into 2017. Maybe 2018, you could push it, but that would have been 71, actually. So then what do you do? You look now and the Jews will tell you that this year they're going to observe 75 years. That's five years of seeking these things to understand them. Past 70 that we've been saying, Lord, Lord, what's happening? It's why the whole world of church stopped talking about 70 years. Well, we kept on the trail. And we were revealed in Leviticus the answer. You guys all know this like the back of your hands now. But Leviticus 19 revealed it to us. It said, when you come into the land. So they came into the land in 1949. It says, but when you come into the land and shall have planted all manner of trees. Okay, so they had to plant fruit bearing trees. So they came into the land in 1948, but they did not plant until February of 1949. And their government never officially took official government over after elections until March of 1949, which means it didn't begin in 1948. 1948 is when they came into the land but they needed to also plant all manner of trees. And so then he goes on to tell them, for three years, you can't take from the land. It's uncircumcised and you can't eat of it. It's not for you. And then he says, but in the fourth year. So if they planted in 1949, if you get to 1950, you couldn't say it would be in the first or in the second or in the third or in the fourth year. That you're bringing the fruit from the fourth year in the fourth year. You couldn't have started it from 1948. Because you will have needed to plant before the start counts. This is the evidence of being in the fourth and in the fifth. Which means they planted in 1949. Government took over officially in 1949 in March. So if you go, even if you count from March to March, so from May or March, however you want to say it, the Lord God counts, though, we know, well, I just showed you, right? The Lord God is counting from the Feast of Weeks, as Daniel told us. So if the Lord is counting from the Feast of Weeks, well, then you go from Feast of Weeks, officially 1949, and you go to Feast of Weeks of 1950, in the midst of that first year, in January, February at the New Year of Trees, the first year will have been complete of the New Year of Trees in the first year of Israel. You go 1950, New Year, uh, uh, Feast of Weeks, to 1951, Feast of Weeks, and in the midst of it, the second year of New Year of Trees would have been still in the midst of the second year, right? 51 to 52, Feast of Weeks to Feast of Weeks, in the midst of the third year, third year of New Year's of Trees would have been observed. Then what do you get? 1952 to 1953 is what? In the fourth year. So the fourth year of trees would have been fulfilled in the fourth year of Israel from 1949 to 1950 with the new year of trees, one, two, three, four, until. And then it says in the fifth year, which means the fifth year is theirs. In the fifth year, they got to eat of it. Which means from 1953, new uh, Feast of Weeks, to 1954, Feast of Weeks, that was the beginning of their year one. And in it, they were able to eat the fruit of the New Year of Trees at the fifth year anniversary of the New Year of Trees, which was in the fifth year from when they officially came into the land and planted, New year, uh, planted trees and from the Lord's count. So what happens when you count from Feast of Weeks 1953? Feast of Weeks 1953 to 1954 is year one. From 2022, Feast of Weeks, to 2023, Feast of Weeks, is the 70th year. 
the 70th year. Do you understand why this year is so important? Do you understand why now being also able to connect Daniel 9 in relation to not when they came into the land, that's for Israel in the whole, but when they got Jerusalem. Because Daniel 9 is specific to Jerusalem and the desolations that need to be complete by the time the 70 years of Jerusalem, when they got it, will be fulfilled. Do you realize that what this means? This is the Feast of Weeks starting the 14 years, the Feast of Weeks right here, right here. Feast of Weeks 2023 is the end of 70 years in the Levitical count from chapter 19 for 70 years of Israel and 70 years coming to an end at the Feast of Weeks for Jerusalem in 2037 at the end of 14 years, they're both 100% in line. Do you see why we're excited about this season? Do you understand why it's so powerful to understand this period of time that this is the creation of in the beginning with the Son of Man being the Feast of First Fruits? Let me show you that. Jesus was the first fruits, right? He was the first fruits as the feast of first fruits. And the word beginning is what? <clears throat> it's the word 7225 of Hebrew, which is the word for feast of first fruits. Christ is the first fruits. And God was there with him in that creation in the beginning. The creation in the beginning was Taurus. The Lord God just showed us in Daniel and in other places that it's the Feast of, uh, of uh, Weeks, which is in Taurus, which means in the beginning in Taurus at the Feast of Weeks was the time of what? The beginning, the Feast of First Fruits. Christ, who is the Feast of First Fruits, Christ the beginning, which means if this is to the 70th year, and this is the end of the 70th year, and they're separated now by two months, less 10 days for the moon, guess where you end up? 50 days earlier, the above 14 years is 50 days before the Feast of Weeks and the completion of the 70 years of Israel, the completion of the above 14 years and the attack that will destroy Jerusalem and have them removed from the land for seven years. <clears throat> Did you see what was being shown in here? This is where I was leading you to in Zechariah. Zechariah 1 has these 70 years. Zechariah 7, seven years later, is saying those 70 years. Zechariah 8 is what? The beginning of trumpets, the beginning of the seven years of trumpets. And look who's here. The Lord is no longer saying, I am jealous for Jerusalem. He's saying, I was jealous for Zion. Why? Because he's here. He's here on heavenly Mount Zion. This is the end. This is the end of seals when he came on heavenly Mount Zion. This is the end. Of, this is Daniel 7. When the ancient of days did come. And the one like unto the Son of Man did come to him and, and, and uh, uh, dominion and everything was given to him. This is the Lord here on heavenly Mount Zion coming with paradise. And what does he tell them? Let your hands be strong. Zechariah 8, 9. Let your hands be strong. You that hear in these days by these words, by the mouth of the prophets, which were in the day that the foundation of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid, which will happen during seals. Only the foundation will be laid during seals. That the temple might be built. What does he go on to say? Verse 10. For before these days, there was no hire for man nor for beast. <clears throat> Neither was there any peace to him that went out or came in because of what? The affliction. Isn't that exactly what we just read in chapter 1? 
these 70 years and brings about the affliction? And then what does it say? The Lord himself says, for I set all men, everyone against his neighbor. What is that? Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Well, what happens when you go in the chapters to years and you go to Zechariah 11? Zechariah 11 could be about the 10 and a half year mark. This is when Satan loses his battle after the 1260 days and is cast down to the earth. Look at what you see. The cedar is fallen, right? Oh, you oaks of Bashan, for the vintage of old has come down. That's Satan being cast down. What happens when Satan is cast down? It gets really crazy. Verse 9 says, Then said I, I will not feed you. That that die, let it die. That that be cut off, let it be cut off. And let the rest eat every one the flesh of another. I told you the second half of trumpets is going to be worse than anything. And I took my staff, even beauty, listen to this, and cut it asunder, listen to this, that I might break my covenant, which I made with all people, and it was broken that day. You see, it was Messiah in Daniel 9 that made the covenant. It's Messiah that had to break the covenant because Satan was cast down. This is the point of Matthew's uh, abomination of desolation. The temple will have been rebuilt and they will now step into the temple and declare themselves God. Messiah is now cut off. He's breaking his covenant. Incredible things. So many other things we revealed in here. So then what happens? Then you get to chapter 14. See, after 13 years, right? The start of the 14th year, there's your day of the Lord returning feet down on the Mount of Olives. And it's the second destruction coming. The first one was the Ezekiel 39 at the end of seals. This one is the great battle at the end of the sixth year of trumpets at the seventh year. When the mystery is now made known, they will see him coming as lightning from one end unto the other. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but this is crazy powerful and my voice is going. So you can see the importance, as I said at the very beginning, without knowing the 70 years, <clears throat> you could never have been able to discern the timing. You see, in the past, when I was listening to others years ago, before this all started happening to me, I didn't know any different either. I was just going along with what everybody else. It was like nobody was focusing too much on 70 until that 70th year came. When it passed, nobody else spoke about it. Yet it is all throughout his word. And now we've got the revelation, not only of how to count 70, this is the absolute furthest out to be able to count 70, but you could see that the count of 70 for Israel from Leviticus 19, and the count to the end of the 14, to Jerusalem for Daniel chapter nine, do you realize this is the only year in all of human history? I want you to ponder this for a moment. Let it really sink in what I'm telling you here. In all of human history, from every other time they've gone into the land, there was never a time with Israel and then Jerusalem and the separation of time between them which was what? 19 years, right? Everybody knows the story. 19 years between them. Five, they would tell you, have passed, right? From when they, quote unquote, came into the land the way the Jews count it. And it leaves how many to Jerusalem when they captured it? 14 years. Leviticus told us the true count for when they came into the land. Daniel told us the count to the end of 70 for Jerusalem and the 14 years was the rest of those parts in Daniel 9 that revealed what will take place, in particular, the second seven years, because for the first seven, they'll be removed from the land. 
no time in all of human history, and I'm not saying this tongue-in-cheek, I'm not saying this, you know, excuse the language, but half-assed, at no time in human history will we have the 70 years of Israel, according to God's law in Leviticus count when they came into the land, ending 70 to them, and 14 years later, ending the 70 to Jerusalem to bring about its desolations, which means it's happening during the 14 years, to the completion of their 70th for Jerusalem. Do you understand this can't happen again? Do you understand if, if we say, oh, well, maybe it's one more year and we go to the Feast of Weeks 2024. Do you understand this would be 2038? Jerusalem would be 71, uh, would be 71. I want you to, uh, you know why I'm letting you sink this in, right? Because as you sink this in, you'll realize the time and the importance and the, the, the revelation of what I'm sharing with you right here, right now. 70 ends, 70 ends, and 70 ends. There is no other possible year from the beginning of creation to the end of the millennium that this will ever be able to happen again. And the Lord revealed in the beginning was Taurus at the Feast of First Fruits. It was Christ with the Father at the same time. And now the sun and the moon have gone off course. The sun we know has gone off course by two months and the moon comes out 10 days too early. So 60 days becomes what? 50 days. What's the difference between Taurus Feast of Weeks and Resurrection Feast of First Fruits? 50 days, one is the Son, one is the Father. Whoa. Crazy powerful. Crazy, crazy, insanely powerful. Let it sink in, absorb it. These chapters to years are so mind-blowing. You know, we showed that, here's another one, that in Genesis chapter one, in the beginning, how this came about was a sister I was speaking to who lives in uh, British Columbia, the province over from me. I live in Calgary, Alberta, up in Canada. And we were talking about these things and she thought she was seeing something connected here, but it was completely not pre-trib. She was seeing something that was actually later connected to the rapture, not the pre-trib, but to the mid-trib great multitude rapture. And as we were going back and forth in it, it dawned on me. And when I saw it, I was like, wait a second. And I stopped and I went through it all. And I said, oh my goodness, I just had another revelation. And the revelation was the 21 chapters of John that we already knew, which is a typology of the seven easy years, the seven years of seals and the seven years of trumpets. The 21 chapters, the first 21 chapters of Genesis had a similar typology. In the beginning, in the beginning, okay? Genesis chapter 7 into chapter 8 was the same story as um, John 7 into John 8. What was it in Genesis? It was the story of the ark. The 40 days, right? The 50-day count starting in chapter 7, like the seventh year. And in the 8th, it's over. And the 14 years begin. Same story in John. And in chapter 8, the story begins. And in John chapter 8, what do we see? We see him talking about st throwing a stone at her. Who is the her? It's the worker bride. It's the Smyrna worker bride groups. That only he could throw the stone. He is the representation of that stone throw coming. He is the representation of that stone, that cornerstone, that, that stone of stumbling, that, that you know, the, the cornerstone that the, that the builders rejected. 
He is that stone coming. And then what does he say in John chapter 8? We go to John chapter 8, check this out. Here he is as that stone. It's like he's here, the, 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 the 40 days are about to start. And look at what he says. I am the light of the world. Do you know why he's the light of the world? Why it's connected to the beginning of 14 chapters that remain? Because he, it's the revelation of the, of the light group, the mark group. Remember the creation? When he became light and it was for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, the mark group, the ones he's coming to save. This is the light he's giving to his disciple workers. How about this? You go to Genesis, uh, John 14. And what did Jesus tell them? In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. What happens in the seventh year or the 14th in the big picture? Like John 14. This is when the Lord comes with what? When he comes on heavenly Mount Zion, he's coming with paradise, which is where the rapture group is going. Just like we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. That's where the rapture group goes. He's coming back with the place prepared to receive them unto it. What happens if you go to Genesis chapter 14? What happens when Christ comes? Okay, there's the 14th year. But when Christ comes, okay, it's connected to Lot and the trained up servants as the 144. But watch how clear this gets. Melchizedek shows up for the first time. Who is Christ? Christ is the high priest and king like Melchizedek, right? Everybody tells you about it. He's high priest and king as Melchizedek. Genesis chapter 14 is the story. Look what happens. Genesis chapter 14. When he returns as high priest and king. You think that's a coincidence? This is the typology of Christ in chapter 14. And guess what? When you go to Psalms 110, I think it is. Psalms 110. What does it say? The Lord Father said unto my Lord Jesus, sit thou at my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord, Father, shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou out of the midst of thine enemies. Remember what happened in Revelation chapter 12, verse uh, 5? Right? And she brought forth a man child who is to rule all nations with the rod of iron. He's going to rule in the midst of his enemies because it's still trumpets time. And what happens? Verse 4, Psalms 110, verse 4. The Lord, Father, hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. The Lord is going to be what? He's going to be as Melchizedek, right? High priest and king. When is this? At the end of seals. When is the end of seals? The end right here lined up directly with chapter 14, which is directly related to John chapter 14 when he comes on heavenly Mount Zion to receive them unto himself into paradise. Do you know what happens when you go to Hebrews chapter 7? I won't go into all of them because there's so much. What happens when we go into Hebrews chapter 7? Oh my goodness, it's the story of him as King Melchizedek. <laughs> oh, it's so over the top, right? You can't make this stuff up, stuff up if you tried. You ah, uh, it's it's just wild. <laughs> Here, let me give you another one. How about this one? Judges chapter 15. Okay? Judges chapter 15 is right at the beginning. And what were we talking about in the story of Jacob? To go back to that Jacob story. He didn't want Leah. He wanted Rachel. Ah, I didn't want her. I wanted the beautiful one. I wanted the younger one. Right? So he didn't really want those who are spirit-filled because he's coming for the lost, really. But 
Of course he's happy to have us, right? But his spirit, right? The Holy Ghost, his friend, right? Friends of the Lord. Well, look what happens when you go to Judges 15. Look at that, 21 chapters. But the book of Judges goes in reverse. The 21 chapters actually go from 21, 29. It goes in reverse. So what happens when you get to chapter 15? Check it out. But it came to pass within a while uh, after, in the time of the wheat harvest, that Samson visited his wife with a kid, right? A baby goat, I think it is, right? And she said, I will, and, and he said, I will go in unto my wife into the chamber, but her father would not suffer him to go in. Listen to this, verse two. And her father said, I verily thought that thou utterly hated her. Remember Jacob didn't like Rachel, uh, didn't like Leah? I thought thou utterly hated her. Therefore, I gave her to thy companion. Who's a representation of companion or friend? Like the Holy Ghost, right? Is not her younger sister fairer? So who was the younger, prettier sister? Rachel. Take her, I pray thee, instead of her. It's the same story. Him and his bride, he, he, he was deciding he was going to go in with the other one, but he says, no, I didn't think you liked her. It's the same story. Do you know where it plays out? You guessed it. Right in the tail end of the first seven years. <laughs> it's so awesome. It's so awesomely awesome. It's, it's hard to, to wrap your head around the fact that there are literal chapters to years throughout this entire storyline that reveal the whole story. It's wild. Remember what we said? What about the Lord returning feet down on the Mount of Olives, right? What about when he comes at the end of the 13 years, right? Or at the end of the big picture 20, like Jacob, right? When he fulfilled what? 20 years? There was easy seven for Leah, the next seven for Rachel, six for the cattle. He made a covenant at the end of 20. So at the start of the 21st year, which is at the start of the 14th, he makes a covenant with his father-in-law, which is what? The beginning of the promise for the Jews. And what happens when we go to Genesis chapter 21? Abraham, remember? Abraham turns 114 years later from when he had Ishmael. And the promise of Isaac is come, and he is 100 years old, 14 years from when the story started with Ishmael. You still going to try and say the 14 years aren't true? <laughs> You're not paying attention. You see, you have to spend some time. You have to dig into these things. You have to search them out. Go and prove them for yourself that these are true. I give... Five days or so between videos, four to five days. Plenty of time to seek out, to search out, to discern, to understand. Have you seen where we've spent our time tonight in these chapters, in many of these chapters? The law of Moses, a little bit in the Psalms, and in the prophets. Isn't that 100% what Christ said he was going to do? To those disciples from Luke 24 when he comes, I believe that what is happening here is the preparation of it. Because who do they represent? Who is the Luke's group representing? Let's go back to Luke 21 and look what's happening during those 40 days. The, the but before all these things, okay? Before nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom is this. This is all representing the above 14 years. And what does he tell them is going to start to happen to them? In 2116 of Luke, and you shall be betrayed by both parents and by brethren and kinfolk and friends, and some of you they shall cause to be put to death. Well, guess what? You go to the book of Revelation, you go to the seven churches, and you find out that the typology of Ephesus is to the gospel of john to the more specifically to the apostles when he breathes on them in chapter 20. that's the beginning of the 50 days the escape of the bride of christ that we spoke about in the last 50 days of the last video the escape of the bride of christ 
he breathes on the apostles. It's the stone's throw. That's why they worship that idol because of the, the meteor that struck in Ephesus. This is all connected to the apostles and them beginning their work at the beginning of the 50 days. During this time, the wedding week is happening. When the Lord returns after the wedding, he's going to meet the Smyrna disciple group workers who are represented by, and the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried and have tribulation 10 days, but be thou faithful unto death. And I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh, listen to this, shall not be hurt by the second death. This is the group resurrected to join the Lord as priests during the millennial reign. They're going to rule and reign with them. And we can even prove it by going back. Remember in 1 Peter, when I showed you guys at the beginning, this group in 1 Peter, were those the elect that were kept? They were kept and ready to be revealed for the last time. Who is this group? Go to verse, go to chapter two. To whom coming as unto a living stone. Remember, I said it's the Lord coming who is that stone's throw? Disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Here it is. First Peter 2, verse 5. Ye also, as living stones, are built up a spiritual house, here it is, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ, wherefore also it is contained in the scriptures, behold, I lay in Zion a chief corner stone. Do you know that when you go back into the chapters to years and you go into Psalms 118, you see, where's Psalms 118? Bam, right before it all starts, that 50-day period of which the Son of Man is coming. And what does Psalms 118 tell you? Check this out. Verse 22, Psalms 18, verse 20, 22. The stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. He is that stone. The, the Smyrna, some of them shall be put to death, are the Smyrna disciple workers of Luke chapter 24, the two on the road to Emmaus that represent these workers. These guys are also going to remain here with the apostles during at least the seals portion of time, maybe throughout, but at least the seals. They will follow him for 40 days. They will be anointed at the 50th. And they will be here during seals at least. This group here is the group that when the Lord returns after the one week wedding in heaven, he will return and have a meal with them and serve them. They will follow him and some of them are going to be killed. Some of them are going to be put into prison. But they are the group that will be resurrected to rule and reign with him as priests during the millennial reign. The first group are the apostles when they're chosen. Then you have Pergamum, Pergamus. You see Pergamus, you have martyrs, right? You have martyrs. This is during the, that portion when they're about to have to flee. When they're going to have to then flee into the wilderness. It's, it's about to take place. It's coming close to mid-seals. So what does the Lord say? He's going to feed them with the hidden manna. So you got martyrs and they're being fed with the hidden manna. You see, when you go to the seven churches revelation in the book, the was and the is will all play out in typologies in the is to come. But what took thousands of years will be so much more devastating because it'll play out in only 14 years. Here's your Ephesus. Look what it's called, the day of Israel's espousals. This is the wedding taking place in heaven at the beginning of the 50 days after these guys have been anointed by the Lord breathing on them, which is directly connected to John 
chapter 20, when he anoints the apostles by breathing on them the Spirit, the Holy Ghost. Okay? The Smyrna group are the ones that some of them are going to be put to death. They're going to be traveling the world. These guys both, apostles and disciples, but they're going to be responsible for bringing in the great multitude. They're going to be the ones responsible for creating the greatest revival with the apostles in human history. Persecution is going to begin early for these guys, even before the time of the Mark of the Beast fleeing. This is the time of the first two and a half years, the wandering, the great revival that breaks out right from the beginning of this new apostolic age. These guys are from the beginning of day 50. These guys are eight days later after the wedding in heaven from the start of 40 days all the way through at least till the end of seals. And you could see there's going to be persecution on them right away. This is why it says for Smyrna, some of you shall be in prison and put to death. And in Luke, 24, uh, Luke 21, it's the same some of you that represents Smyrna. The, the, the church of Smyrna in history were the ones through Bishop Polycarp who were the 14thers. They were the ones that were called the true Christians back in the day. Could you believe that? I didn't do that study. There was another brother that did that study that somebody shared with me. I think it was our sister Faye. A couple months ago, I shared it in a video. The true ones outside of the church were standing up for the truth of Scripture. It was Smyrna. And they were, they were, they were despised by the church. And they were called, well, they were called heretics. But they stood up for the truth of the 14th day. They were called 14thers. We're standing up for the truth of the 14 years with the revelation of his word. And we're being cursed out against for the 14 years. Pretty crazy, right? Then what happens? This church of Pergamum, this is the period of Israel's wilderness. See, the age of Constantine, the typology of the Antichrist. Pergamum represents the time of, Dan, uh, 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 of Mark chapter 13, the abomination of desolation. When they're going to what? Flee to the wilderness. The time when Antichrist shows up, the typology of Constantine. This is when he gets his power to continue. 42 months is the typology. Thyatira. Thyatira is that second half of seals. It'll be the darkest time that it was in all of human history up to that point, which is exactly what it says when Antichrist gets that power. And they'll still remain in that wilderness Till the Lord comes at the end of the sixth seal. Well, guess what happens? If you follow the seven churches, look at how they're divided. Why on earth were the seven churches divided with four of them in chapter one, in chapter two, and three of them in chapter three? Probably never thought of that before, did you? There's an actual reason. There's a prophetic understanding as to the purpose of the division of the four and then the three being represented in how they're split up. Okay? That's why you see the martyrs. They're fleeing into the wilderness. He's going to feed them in the wilderness with his hidden manna. Then you come to Thyatira. In Thyatira, you see what's being spoken about and, and those who, who wait till the end. And listen, listen what it says. And he shall rule them. Revelation 2, 27. And he shall rule. Hold fast till I come. Okay, verse 25. Verse 27. And he shall rule them with what? A rod of iron. What did we just talk about with the rod of iron? Revelation chapter 12, verse 5. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. We went to Psalms 110 when he's Melchizedek in that seventh year of seals. When he will be as Melchizedek and he will rule with a rod of iron. <laughs> It's awesome, isn't it? And I will give him the morning star. Right? This is the Lord coming. Him coming on heavenly Mount Zion to receive them to paradise, the place prepared and built. It's incredible. So what is, what is Thyatira? The fourth church, right? 
is to the end of the Dark Ages. This takes us from the beginning, the above 14 years, through seals, through the Antichrist, through Mark's discourse, to the end of Mark's discourse, right? At the end of Thyatira. This is to the end of the sixth year of seals is the representation. And then what happens at the end of the sixth year? The Lord comes on heavenly Mount Zion. Listen to what it says. It's the Church of Reformation. That's right. It's the Reformation. It's the restoration of the truth. And look what happens. It's the period of Israel's kings. It's the house of Israel's king. It's Christ. It's Christ who's now going to be what? Exactly, exactly, exactly what we just showed earlier in Daniel chapter 7, when at the end of the 42 months, there he is coming on heavenly Mount Zion, the father, right? The ancient of days did sit. And when the beast was killed, what happened? One like the son of man came in the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days and they brought him before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom and that all people should serve him in all languages. This is his coming in, Sar uh, uh, sorry, in Sardis is his coming at the end of the sixth year of seals. This is the time of the seventh year of seal. Whoops, Sardis is the time of the seventh year of seals to the start of trumpets. He comes, he reforms the church. He brings and gathers those to himself. The Gentile age is over. He is now king of kings and Lord of lords. You want to know which one that one is? Revelation chapter 17. 17, right, right here. Revelation 17, verse 14, is when he comes at the end of the sixth year of seals. Okay, at that seventh year. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. Only one uppercase L and one uppercase K. Okay? This is when he destroys. Look, the, the, the ten horns, everything else. This is the end of seals when he comes. He's coming as Lord of lords and King of kings. But not in the final glory, all uppercase yet. You see, Israel's kings, the house of Israel, the Mark group, the, the world represented by, by the 10 tribes that scattered throughout the earth, mixed in with the Gentiles. Nobody really can tell who they are now. It's what we would call the church. The great multitude raptures come in and he is now on heavenly Mount Zion. He is Melchizedek ruling and reigning with the rod of iron. Right? It's awesome. See, that's why you saw him coming, ruling with the rod of iron. At the very end, let's go Revelation 2. Because this is him coming in Thyatira. Right at the very end of the six years of, of seals. That rod of iron. Sardis is now when he gathers them to himself. He now gathers them to himself. The rapture has taken place and he's now ruling and reigning as Melchizedek. Okay? So what do you get? You come to over here. You have the end of seals to the beginning of trumpets. Right? This is like, I call this that seventh year. That, that one year in between. Because what do you have? Seven, six years, seven thrusts. Six years, seven thrusts. Look at what he says. Watch, I will come as the thief. Uh, what else does he say? Overcome shall be clothed with white raiment. This is the rapture time, right? They're going to be the ones clothed with white raiment. As you read in Revelation chapter 7, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. Now what happens? Church of Philadelphia. The Church of Philadelphia is another group of workers. So you had the first group of workers were the apostles. You had the Smyrna group of workers who were the disciples, the Luke group. Now you have the Philadelphia group of workers 
the Philadelphia Church of Workers, these guys are the 144,000 that everybody talks about. You see, here we are now, and what does it say? Which cometh down out of heaven, uh, verse 12. Revelation 3, verse 12. Which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I write upon him my new name. What about if you go to Revelation 14? Ever wonder why the, son, why the lamb is standing on Mount Zion with the 144,000? Because he's here on heavenly Mount Zion with the 144,000. And it has what? His father's name written on their foreheads. So where are we now? We're now done that year, and we're now beginning trumpets. The 144,000 are going to be sent out now. What happens while they're sent out? It's the first three and a half years of trumpets. What happens at the end? You see, they're the missionary ones. Smyrna were the ones that were persecuted. Philadelphia, they're the evangelists, right? They're the evangelists. And when they go out, just like Philip, Philadelphia, Philip, the evangelist, they go out during the first three and a half years of trumpets. While the Lord is there, while the, while the temple is being rebuilt, they follow the lamb wheresoever he goes. And what happens at the end of the three and a half years of trumpets, the first three and a half? The period of Israel's removal. Well, what happens 10 and a half years into, into tribulation, three and a half years into trumpets? Messiah is cut off. You see how that works? Messiah is cut off. They did their three, first three and a half years, and now Messiah is cut off. What happened to these guys when Messiah got cut off? He gave them greater power. He gave them greater power to tread on scorpions and all sorts of things. Why? Because the pit's going to be opened. And Messiah is going to be removed, cut off. Just like the 10 and a half year mark in Zechariah 11, which represents the, 11, uh, the 10 and a half years in chapter 11 of Zechariah, which represents the end of the 1260 days in Revelation. And then what happens? Satan has been cast down. And what do you get? The final apostasy. The final Laodicea of the end of the age. Because even though we're in Laodicea now, Laodicea will end. And it just so happens the Jews are ruling right now, right? Not Israel, but the Jews. The Laodicean age is about to end at the escape of the bride of Christ. And when the Laodicean age ends in the one that we're in right now, it will go back to Ephesus at the beginning of the 50 days and it'll be all the is to come. The was, the is that were just about done. When the, when the pre-trib escape happens, it will then begin the is to come. And what happens when mid-trumpets comes to an end at the removal of Israel's king as the Messiah being cut off, what happens in the final Laodicean age? It's the apostasy. What apostasy might you say? Does it ring a bell? What happens when the pit is open? What happens in Revelation 17 that we were sharing about earlier? What happened with the was for 42 months, is not during the 1260, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition? When does this happen? You got it. Ten and a half years into tribulation, three and a half years, or about three and a half years into trumpets, when Messiah is cut off, <clears throat> when the son of perdition comes up. Remember where that is? Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Or 2 Thessalonians, yeah, chapter 2. What is this falling away? Right? What is this falling away, the apostasy everybody talks about? When is it going to happen? That the man of sin reveal, be revealed, the son of perdition at the apostasy. When is the pit going to be opened 
<laughs> that the son of perdition at the apostasy takes place in the end of days? At mid trumpets, after the removal of Messiah, when he's cut off and it becomes the final apostasy for the final two and a half of three and a half years, and it'll be the time of Judah's kings because we know not all of them are going to be going on the wings of eagles, but there's going to be that fallen away group in the apostasy that will fall for this Antichrist come back with Satan. Because remember what the Lord said? What did he say? Not to all Jews. Don't misunderstand that. But what did he say to some of those Jews and the Pharisees? That they were of their father, the devil. At the apostasy, when the pit opens, when the Antichrist returns at the, re at the opening of the pit, when Satan is bad and cast down, it's the final apostasy of the Laodicean age. We have also been revealed, as I have shared and talked about many times, the revelation of the end time seven churches, brothers and sisters. This is the revelation of the end of days. You see, who are these groups of workers? I showed you John chapter 20 represented the apostles who were anointed when he breathed on them. I showed you that Luke, when you go to Luke 24, they were the ones, the two on the road to Emmaus represented, I believe, by two groups of 12,000. Uh, 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 um, Ephesus group. No, uh, um, um, what's the name? I can see the name in my head. Uh, Dan and Ephraim. By the good side of Dan and Ephraim, Antichrist will come from the bad side of Dan. There's the good side of Dan, which is the overcoming eagle side. The other one is the serpent that remains on its belly. He has two sides. And that these two groups that are the workers are the ones that he does what? He's going to open unto them their understanding after he has that meal with them and serves them. And what does he tell them to do? That repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send you the promise of my father upon you. This is when they'll be anointed by the Holy Ghost on the 50th day. They will follow him for 40 days. They will be anointed and work at least during seals. Who are the 144,000 and when are they sealed? They're sealed at the end of Mark, <coughs> which is the end of seals. And what does he tell them? First of all, he was upset with them because he's not going to believe the testimony of the remaining of the two groups of disciple workers when they come to tell them that the Lord is coming on Mount Zion. And when the Lord comes, they're eating and he unbraids on them. He rails on them for their disbelief that the Lord was coming. Remember I told you the creature was found in Mark? So they're to preach to the creatures. They're going to help. The 144,000 are first going to help the other disciple workers from seals bring in the great multitude rapture group. That's why they're sealed in Revelation chapter 7 before the great multitude rapture comes in. And then what, is it, what does this group get given power for? It says, um, he that believe and is baptized shall be saved. He that believe not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils and they shall speak in new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Remember, they're working during trumpets. Um, then, uh, so then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up unto heaven and sat on the right hand of God. When do we read about Christ sitting on the right hand of God? Psalms 110, right at the end of seals. How about that, right? And listen to what the Lord says. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them. Remember in Revelation chapter 14, he was on Mount Zion with the 144,000. The Lord is working with them and confirming the word with signs following because they're now going out during the first three and a half years as the Philadelphia group going out as the evangelists and the Lord following them 
in, in these things that he's doing along the way because he's there out of Mount Zion. Now, what about Matthew? Matthew's group is the final group represented as the 12 tribes. That's why in Matthew 24, at the Lord's coming, when he's coming as lightning from one end to the other and the whole world will see him, it says, then the tribes went, ah, and they were freaking out. And this is represented by them. The entire commission is completely different than the other ones. And listen what he tells them to do. Or listen what he tells them. Uh, starting in verse 18, Matthew 28, verse 18 to the end. And Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Well, that's what happens at the seventh seal. We read about it, right? It says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. You see, the other ones said preach. There's no more need for preaching because he's going to be here, feet down on the Mount of Olives, like Zechariah chapter 14. They're now to go out and to teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and in the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Again, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I command you. So they got to be taught. Now, the world that's remaining has to be taught the ways of the Lord. Because remember what happens. They got to go up at tabernacles every year to, to bring worship to the Lord. Or they'll have waters held back from them during the millennial reign for their seasons. And then what does he say? And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. You see, the church has had this all mixed up. This is the literal end of the world at the end of the millennial reign, which means these guys are going out during the millennial reign. <coughs> and the Lord is there with them till the end of the world. So you had a John group apostles. You had a Luke group, the, the Smyrna disciples. You have the Philadelphia, 144,000. And then you've got the Matthew group at the end as those that are going out to teach the ways of the Lord during the millennial reign. Now, when you go to the book of Revelation, chapter 20 and 21, as we get close to winding this down now, in chapter 20, you see those who get to be part of the first resurrection. Remember, that's what, that's what Smyrna was told. That those who died of Smyrna, they would be the ones that would reign with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead would not be resurrected. See? Because these guys were the ones that only had part in the first resurrection. Nobody else has part in the resurrection until after the millennial reign is done. What does it say about this group? Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests. Priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with them a thousand years. This is the Smyrna group of workers, the represented Luke ones. But now where's the apostles? What about the 144,000? What about the, the 12 tribes and the millennial workers? Watch this. Revelation 21, you're not going to see the Luke group because they were ruling and reigning with him for a thousand years. So look at the honor that the other three groups get. <clears throat> Here's New Jerusalem, right? New Jerusalem coming down at the end of the millennial reign. And what do you see it described as? You see 12 foundations. The 12 foundations, which were during seals that will be physically built, as well as the spiritual foundations of seals. And it's represented by the apostles. And then what do you have? You have the wall. And the walls are represented by 144 in the typology of what? When the walls are being built during trumpets, when the 144,000 are going out. The walls are built on top of the foundations because the foundations are laid during seals. The walls are built during trumpets. Hello. And then what? Then you got the Matthew group. You have what? The 12 tribes that are represented 
as the 12 gates during which the millennial reign people will come in through the gates that they represent they are coming in through those gates because remember they're going out during the millennial reign and the lord is here with them always even until the end of the world so when the millennial reign is all done and everything's done and they go to heaven they're coming down represented as the foundations the walls and the gates the only group missing from this is the luke group of smyrna workers and their reward was the ruling and reigning with christ for the millennial reign because they are his remnant gentile bride they are the co-heirs with christ who were the spirit group from in the beginning i told you this was going to cover a lot i told you this was going to be powerful guys man did we ever cover a lot <laughs> <laughs> I think I did it in about three hours as well. So within a, a respectable period of time, I took you through pieces of the Gospels and the differences. Why? Because of Matthew. The 14 years, the big picture of the 21, the 14,000, the 21,000, a portion of the 50, pre, mid, post, chapters to years, 70 years of Israel, seven churches, Daniel 9, Daniel 12, 42 months, 1260, time and times and half a time antichrist satan the creations 50 1450 the 50 days and the 40 days of the son of man the four separate worker groups the discourses the book of revelation the laws of moses the psalms and the prophets <laughs> i can't believe i just did what i did in three hours oh my goodness thank you lord the spirit is leading and these are the types of videos that just fire me up. I, oh man, I'm not going to be going to sleep till probably two, three o'clock tonight. Can't believe it's midnight already. I got a late start. Man, I, I really hope and pray you guys let this sink in. Let it sink in, absorb it. Look at all these tabs. See all these tabs, all these little lines that you see up here? All of these tabs were open for tonight's video. And because the Spirit has been leading so powerfully for five and a half years, I didn't even open one except to show you the first one of Ecclesiastes. That is unbelievable to me. <laughs> it, I can only laugh because otherwise I would cry and freak out. It's impossible to know what I know except the Lord willed it and the Spirit revealed it. What do you think that means to you guys? It means the same thing. Because you couldn't understand it if the Spirit never led you to understand it and the Father didn't give it to the Spirit to give it to you to understand it. This is powerful stuff. And there is no other period of time in human history where the 70th of Israel will end and the 70th of Jerusalem will end where they will be sandwiched between 14 years. And what comes above 14 years? 50 days. This is the fathers. This is the sons. Brothers and sisters, I cannot tell you 100% because I do not know 100%. But I can tell you with everything that I believe within myself, with all of this incredible revelation that I just gave you a summary of a glancing over of parts and pieces. You notice I never skipped a beat? I never, there was no, uh, where does this go? What is? Every single part and piece was laid out in order, completely understood. And that included the 70 on both ends. So if the 70th is on both ends and the father is Taurus at the Feast of Weeks and that's the start of the 14 years, there's only one thing that equals 50 days above it. Man, I'm excited. <laughs> 
I'm going to cry, so I'm going to chuckle a little bit. <laughs> I don't want to start tearing up again. I'm enough of a basket case doing this every time. It's, it's, it's incredible. God is so good. We are so blessed, and we deserve none of it. But I am eternally grateful for all of it. Good, bad, attacks, the love, the support, the strengthening, each and every one of you picking up each other, praying over each other, supporting each other. That's exactly what we're supposed to be doing. So let's keep it up and let's finish strong, brothers and sisters. God bless you. I love you. God bless your families. And if I don't talk to you again soon, then you know it's because I'll be seeing you face to face in his presence, standing before him with you. God bless you. God bless your families again. We'll see you soon. Bye for now.